This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This public hearing of the Town of Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but the public can listen to the proceedings by clicking a link on the Town's webpage. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A, Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. We will begin with a roll call of the regular members of the ZBA who have been impaneled for consideration of the items on tonight's agenda. Mr. Steve Judge is here, that's me. Mr. Langsdale? Here. Ms. O'Meara? It appears that she stepped away. Yep, we'll get back to Ms. O'Meara. Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Here. And associate members, um, Ms. Waldman? Here. Mr. Barrick? Mr. Greeny? And Mr. Meadows? Ms. O'Meara, you're here? Here. All right. Also in attendance tonight is Maureen Pollock, Christine Brestle, and David Wasikevitz of the Amherst uh, Town Staff, as well as Jonathan Witten, a KP law firm who is serving as outside counsel to the board on this matter. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 48, the General Laws of the Commonwealth, for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the town of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaws is section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. Each petition is heard by the board is distinct and is evaluated on its own merits. And the board is not ruled by precedent. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing after which the board will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input, if time permits. The board speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raise hand function on their screen. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, please state your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. And I want to remind the applicant, my fellow board members and the public to seek recognition of the chair before speaking. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not open, not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. By statute, for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20-day appeal period for an agreed party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in Superior Court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda is as follows. A public hearing to consider ZBA 2020-39, Valley Community Development Corp, 132 Northampton Road, a request to a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40B 
to construct a new two and a half story residential multifamily building containing 28 small studio apartments and related common areas on an approximate 0.88 acre property located at 132 Northampton Road, Map 14C, Parcel 8, General Residence and Educational Zoning Districts. This he public hearing is continued from July 2nd, 2020. The items to be discussed tonight are as follows. The applicant will finish the PowerPoint presentation from his July 2nd public hearing. ZBA and the applicant will discuss the public, the public PowerPoint presentation from the applicant. The applicant presents a detailed support, supportive services plan and the ZBA and, and the board will discuss that. Board discussion regarding general laws, chapter 44, section 53G and a motion on that subject if needed. Uh, a board compilation of questions, requests and possible condi conditions for considerations and other items ZB ZBA chair may deem appropriate. Then there's general, then there's general public comment period that we have each time and other business not anticipated within 48 hours. We have a full agenda tonight and I do not expect there will be time for public comment during this meeting. We have had another public hearing set for, we have another public hearing set for August 20th on this application. And during that public hearing, we will set aside sufficient time for public comment on the application as we did for the July 2nd public hearing. Since the July 2nd public hearing, the board has received the following documents. The, application, the applicant has submitted the full PEL application and its supportive services plan. The applicant has also resubmitted the July 2nd PowerPoint presentation. Since the July 2nd hearing, the board has received three public comments. An email from Jim and Bert Schlesinger, a memo from Barbara and Al Wilbur, and an email from Hillary Wilbur Farrell, all dated July 28th, August 5th, and August 5th. I wish to note that associate member, uh, Maureen, is there any other um, documents that we've received that I did not list? No, that, that's it. I wish to note that the associate board member, Sharon Waldman, is a designated alternate member for consideration of this comprehensive permit. Although she could not attend the July 2nd public hearing, she has watched the video of the hearing and filed the appropriate paperwork, and she will be eligible to vote if called upon to do so. Ms. Walden, is that correct? Yes. Walden, is that correct? Thank you. The first item tonight is for the applicant to complete the July 2nd presentation. After that presentation, the board may ask questions. I'll remind the board members that the supportive services plan is the topic of a discussion item uh, following the discussion of the July 2nd presentation. And I think the bulk of our time will be spent on the supportive services plan. So please hold your questions regarding supportive services until that time. So do we have the um, representative from the applicant uh, ready to, to, to speak to this? Sure, uh, one moment, let me, um, let me bring them up. All right. Great. Good evening. Hi. Hi. Um, can you identify yourself and your position and your address, please? Absolutely. Um, I'm Jane Leckler, and I am the uh, executive director at Valley Community Development, uh, replacing Joanne Campbell just recently. Um, I've been in the background of these meetings while Laura Baker has been presenting, and she's on vacation this week, a well-deserved vacation. And uh, so I'm going to be doing my best with uh, Rachel and Tom on the line. Um, and we have Felicity Hardy here as well, um, representing Valley. So, oh, and my address, um, uh, Valley's address is 256 Pleasant Street in Northampton, Mass. Perfect. Thank you. Well, when we last met, uh, we were going through a July 2nd presentation. Um, we did not have time to finish that. And the first order of business is to finish the presentation from July 2nd. Great. So you may proceed. Okay. 
So, uh, Maureen, I can just share my screen? Yes, yep. Now, what I'm hoping for here is that um, we are, re I'm recalling correctly where we left off. I'm gonna flip through quickly. I believe we made it through the bike storage shed um, and we talked about the lighting plan. And then we, um, and the lighting fixtures. So we're gonna pick up right here. Um, did we talk about the parking management plan? I, recall? I think that comes, I don't have this uh, completely memorized. I think that's still coming. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. Since, since we're going to, since you're going to begin um, briefly discussing the supportive services plan, we're going to spend a lot of time on that. That's the next item. So go through that briefly and then um, discuss the supportive service plan in more detail in the next item. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we left the slides in the order that they were in. And so really, we're just we have a placeholder here, um, saying exactly that. Um, so thank you, Steve. And so we'll pick up on this um, in two additional sections coming up. Um, uh, the I will just mention here that the request was um, that we're responding to directly is whether the supported service plan that we submitted as a part of our PEL was up to date. Um, and our response there is that this is a draft plan uh, that has been submitted to DHCD. Uh, DHCD described it as a robust plan, but the plan would not be final until approved and the funding is granted by DHCD. So then we'll, like, as, as we said, we'll go into this in more detail coming up. Um, one of the board's questions was about distance from neighboring properties. And so what we've got here are some measurements um, narratively. Um, so, and then I think it's easier to look at the plan, but I'll pause here on this slide that um, the, the footprint of our current house is 79 feet from the neighbor's house. And then the project's proposed location is 66 feet from the property line, um, closest to the massing of the neighbor, and then 90 feet approximately to the west of the property line. So this estimates the new building will be 145 to 169 feet from the neighbor's house at 126. So here is, I'll just use my cursor, if you can see my cursor. This is the new footprint outlined in red towards the lower left here of the proposed building. This gray is the existing building. And then this is the neighbor's building at 126 Northampton. And then here is the indications of the measurements that we just described. The, here's the property line between the two and then the entire distance between buildings. I think that's pretty straightforward. Any questions on that? Yeah, I have one. Okay. Mr. Langsdale. Um, <clears throat> you showed the distance from the new footprint to the 126 Northampton Road, but it's on the footprint, it's to the uh, setback of the building rather than the front corner. What's that distance? <clears throat> Um, I do not have additional measures here, but we can certainly provide that. Let me make sure I do not believe. Yeah, we do not have that measure on here. So we would have to provide that for you, Mr. Langsdale. Okay. Okay. You. You'd like it from uh, Northampton Road? Uh, no. Oh, I'm sorry then. From the corner of the building, the, the most prominent corner toward the 126 Northampton to the house, you have, you've measured 172.42 from 126 to the setback mm -hmm. of the new footprint. Yes. Can I, 
clarify? I think what, if I, if I can help, I think what he's looking for is he wants from that point by this, where it right says 66. Here. Yeah, right where it says 66 to the house. Right. Is that correct, Mr. Langsdale? I'm yeah. sorry. Okay. Uh, Rachel, were you going to say something there? I was going to say, I can pull that up on my computer here and, and provide that answer in a little bit. I just need to open the file and get there. But, um, okay. Why don't we let you do that, Rachel, and we'll proceed. Okay. Um, we are there are, any, uh, any other questions regarding the distance to the between the two uh, abutting properties? Okay. okay. Proceed. We have a snow removal plan um, that inclu includes um, quite a bit of detail um, in response to the board's request here about de-icing methods um, and snow removal. Um, our snow and ice removal plan, I'm going to just outline the basics of our plan. And then um, Rachel has done quite a bit of um, research and has some information to add on um, products that would be used on snow on ice removal. So our approach here is just to make sure that we're using um, the strategies that work on paved surfaces and that um, are the uh, best treatment for pavement and or surrounding planting. So there's a combination of factors there that we'll describe. So the goal of the snow removal plan is to preserve access for vehicles to the property and support emergency vehicle turnaround and access to the hydrant if necessary. The most important part of the plan is the removal of the material from the pay service for the safety of residents and staff and visitors. Um, I, I don't know, Rachel, if you want to just pick up here. So I think there'd be a little bit more continuity if you. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. So we're, we're going to use uh, the three chemicals that we would like the and we talked about this before, I think at the last meeting a little bit, um, but we're gonna be using uh, chemicals that have a, the low, least impact on the paved areas and the planting areas. Um, and based upon what the weather conditions at the time in terms of temperature are, it will help, help the management decide what's the most appropriate material um, for that. And that just pointing out that we're using you know, one strategy, one strategy would be to not have any plantings and just push the snow into the site, but then that would really have more of a institutional feel and not feel like a residence. So we're really trying to make this feel homey with lots of shrubs. Um, and so the, the team as um, developer and the management has have agreed to, um, in, in cases where the snow can't be pushed anywhere on site, that um, it will be trucked off site in heavy snows. So, um, Ms. Lafler, I'm, I'm can, you show me, there. can you show me on the uh, drawing of the, of the property where the snow would be pushed to if it's not trucked away? Well, I think that um, the grass paved areas is are what we would use first for storage. So, um, I think that that site, I don't know that, that the site plan I just showed um, is going to visually um, illustrate that. Um, I know we do have a site plan that would do that. There's the um, the paver the the green pavered area of the parking that we've described in a previous mm -hmm. um, presentation. And we're not expecting that that area would be used for parking, so that would be the on-site place that we would push the snow. And then if there was snow beyond that that needed to be stored, we would need to have that removed from the site. Uh, excuse me. Mr. Linesville. In, in previous presentations, you've talked about the those green pavers. I mean, that's shown as part of the parking mm -hmm. lot. So to say that there's not going to be parking there and you're gonna push snow there, where do those cars go? Well, we wouldn't put, we, I'm sorry, let me clarify. We are not expecting that the spaces will all be used. If the spaces are being used in the winter, we will remove the snow from the area where spaces are, cars are being parked and we would need to go off site for snow storage at that point. If there are no cars there, we would use that area for storage. 
all right, but if, if there are no cars there at the time the snow comes down, but then there are cars that need to park there after that, where mm -hmm. do they park? Well, I think that's a fair question. And I think we would um, both have a sense of how much parking is being used. If it were being utilized, we would clear those spaces and take it off site. To so are you, spaces. are you saying that if you, if you have permits and um, badges for every spot on mm -hmm. your parking space, you, you have to put it someplace else? Absolutely. So, are, so if you have leased out each of those parking spaces, you'd have to store it off site. Is that correct? We would not be leasing the spaces, but yes, if but we had. Whatever, it, however, you assign those spaces. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. All right. I mean, there's a question about how many spaces. That's We can talk about that in the parking plan, but. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Okay. Good. Any other questions on um, snow removal? From the members. All right. Great. Uh, yeah, I have. I have one thing. Uh, I, I would like to request that when you put these uh, pieces of information up, which are all words, and you start talking about different aspects of it, I don't get to read these. You know, we should go over these point by point. I, yeah, I think that's fair. I think Rachel and I are just getting a little aligned there. So why don't I just make sure that we go through these four slides so that there's no question okay. that we're seeing, that you're seeing all the content. So I'm just going to back up. Thank you. Yes, no problem. So this was the slide that I covered that was describing the snow and ice removal plan. And we, we, we spent a moment there. So I think we're good there. But I'll leave a moment. I had a question, Mr. Chair. Yes, Ms. Dillon. Um, yeah, so the idea is that you would, you would put the snow on, um, parking you don't expect to be utilized. And then if it's, if it's sitting there and then let's say for some reason, you're the tenants wanted to utilize that parking, I believe they're, they're allowed to have guests if people wanted to now in the event of a snowstorm, is it just expected that, or after a snowstorm, if there's a lot and there's a, a, a large pile there that would, would persist for a long time. Is it just expected that? Uh, tenants can now no longer use those spots? Is it if a tenant says if the parking lot is full, they say, hey, we expect to, to have somebody coming here to utilize those spots, would would you then haul that off site, even if it were for, you know, say one day that somebody needed that there? It, it seems a little weird that in the wintertime, those spots would go away and accept that request. That, that somebody has to do it. So, so that's the idea that in the event of heavy snow, you would lose those spots if no one's utilizing them at the time of the snowstorm. And then it would potentially continue losing those spots for however long that snow then lasts there. Is that the idea? I'm not exactly. And I'm speaking from my experience in um, property management and, and similar situations that there are winters where there is a lot of snow. And typically, if a lot of snow and storage on site is getting in the way of the known patterns of parking, we remove all of it. We maximize the parking spaces. And we would always do that on this site. So we would want to have all available spaces that are being used. So it isn't a day by day or in the moment decision. It's more that if we are routinely only using eight parking spaces, we would leave the snow there um, and not expect that it would cause a problem. Um, if, if all of the parking spaces were routinely being used and there were a heavy snow, we would take all of the snow off site. Uh, following up on that, um, still lying still? do you have, ha, have you, do you have, and have you shown to us other areas where there can be, where the snow can be, uh, uh, moved into? I mean, are the, it, are those are those parking spaces the only place you're talking about storing uh, snow? Uh, at, at my level of knowledge, and I'm going to let Rachel add to this if she and Laura have had other conversations, what we're looking for is a balance that we are not causing snow storage or any of the um, uh, residual uh, effects of snow being stored 
um, including these um, materials that we would use for ice removal, we would not want to harm the landscaping. So we would not want to store snow in the middle of the lawn where we've got perennials or plantings that are gonna be harmed by snow storage. So that is why at this particular point, this is the plan that we have is that we would use that area. We would not store snow on the, um, on the lawn um, or anywhere else on the site because we need to make sure that this access is available for vehicles and emergency vehicles. So it, it seems uh, to, go ahead, Mr. Langsdale. Yeah, well, you say that uh, what is going to harm the grass if you pile snow up in one area? Is it the chemicals that you're using? Is that what you're talking about? Well, the balance, it, uh, the, the, what Rachel was describing is that we're, we're looking for the balance of um, ice removal products that would not bring harm to plants in most cases, but there's a, there's just a, there's the nature of, of winter that, you know, if we've had a lot of ice and a lot of ice removal, we know what's happening there with storing, we just wouldn't want to harm the landscaping. So we would pay to have the snow removed rather than take that risk. So and I think, I, yeah, go ahead, Rachel. I could add, oh, um, there's, a, there's a physical barrier that we're creating by screening the parking area and putting in a lot of shrubs between the parking area and the front door building and the street. And that, many of those areas cannot withstand dumping snow on top of, it would damage and break some of the shrubs nor the, um, the woody shrubs that have really um, rigid, rigid branches. Um, In so this that, area. Yeah, and so we're using, there are little bits of areas that can take on some snow and we anticipate that will have overspill from removal operations, but we don't really have wide swaths of lawn that are open and have immediate adjacency to the parking area to push the snow. You know, I, I think the takeaway from this is that we've got some concern amongst board members about the snow removal plan and that there may be a need to have additional uh, places to put snow, maybe expanding, for example, expanding the pavers from, the six, from those six or eight spaces to more. Um, but I think what I would like to do is put this on the list of things that we have questions about and ask you to come back. You've heard the concerns. It's yes. pretty direct. And I, I think we've, we're not going to solve this problem tonight, yep. but I think you should come back with a plan to have a space where, we, where you can push snow and ensure that at, at least the number of parking spaces that you're asking for are available to people all the time during the winter. Okay. And then we can have that, we'll discuss that at one of our next, one of our upcoming meetings. But that's exactly one of the things we want to talk, that we have on the agenda tonight is other questions we want to pose that to makes, you. That and makes total sense. Us. That makes total I, sense. Yep. But I don't want to please run through the rest of these slides and then we'll go on to the next subject. Okay. okay? I want to make sure that we um, pause on each of these. So yep. this next slide was um, describing, um, I think what Rachel just described, the shrub plantings adjacent to the area. Um, and so this is to, the, those are to screen the parking areas to and the um, dense shrub plantings are having that impact of helping us with stormwater and then creating a more residential feel to the property. And then the contractor being mentioned here would be instructed to avoid those plantings in the plowing path and only use the designated areas. So that's a little bit of what we've described, but we'll clarify in future. So then um, again, the heavy in heavy storms, and this would be the case, whatever our, um, you know, wherever we arrive with a plan that, um, um, suits the concerns here. Um, there is always the option to take snow off site. And then in smaller storms, snow is easily pushed to the periphery of the parking areas and there's no need for any storage or concern or um, loss of parking spaces. Okay. Okay. I see no questions, go ahead. All right. So um, this was the combination of the use of sand and salt that um, Rachel was describing. Rachel, do you just want to go through these points real quick? Sure, yeah. Um, we can use sand uh, to provide traction on slippery surfaces. It, it does not actually uh, break down the ice or de-ice, but it is a, is a method to be used. 
Um, and then, as I mentioned before, the treating the icy areas, we would be using products that are least detrimental to plants. There are a couple of products, they're a little bit more expensive than sodium chloride, um, but that, that are, um, that are used. So p potassium chloride would be avoided because that especially interferes with the uptake of nutrients to plant systems. Sodium chloride is used a lot and that's why everybody calls it salt um, because it's very cost effective and it works down to 12 degrees Fahrenheit. But it is notorious for building up in adjacent soils and interfering with um, plants' ability to take nutrients. And so um, you, might see, you might have heard of this in other areas where farmers using potable water for irrigation that has high chlorine in it um, causes, uh, causes problems with crops growing because it's too much salt in the soil. Um, calcium chloride is used a lot in highway de-icing efforts, and it's actually really effective down to negative 25, and it has been shown to have minimal impact on plants. So that's an option that we might use in our, in our tool house. There's another slide. Yeah. Um, also, with de-icing, we're, we're also looking at pavement and how that interacts with the chemicals. Um, concrete cures for the first year, so even after it's poured and it appears to be pretty solid, it's continuing to cure and strengthen and harden. Um, and you guys, people may have seen witnesses in their own homes, but um, if, if you apply sodium chloride salt on a newly installed concrete step or walkway in that first year, it can contribute to premature spalling and cracking. Um, it, what it does is it increases the number of freezing thaw cycles that, that that piece of pavement is experiencing and causes it to break down very quickly. Um, so on, on all our projects, we often recommend using an alternative de-icer on concrete in that first year anyway, call it urea, it's a fertilizer, um, and, and it's effective up to 21 degrees Fahrenheit, or down, I should say, down to 21 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, another option is calcium magnesium acetate. It's, it's um, more of a liquid solution, and it's effective down to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, um, but and it, the way it works is it keeps the particles from binding, the actual salt, uh, sorry, the actual ice particles from binding together. Um, so in summary, we're hoping to use a combination of sand, calcium chloride, urea, or calcium magnesium acetate to, to deal with the, whatever, the, what the temperatures are, the amount of precipitation, what the forecast is, uh, to be able to manage safely um, ice on site. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Apologies for a bumpy start there to you, Rachel, and to the board on our slides. <laughs> You're doing uh, <laughs> Zoom, it, Zoom is a challenge. Zoom is a challenge. We're all getting well, through, and, so. and I thought we had left off somewhere else, so my head was in a little different place. So, um, right. okay. Great, so our parking management plan, um, we're going to describe here. Um, the board had asked about the plan um, and how it accounts for the parking needs. So I'm just gonna um, leave this slide up and describe that we have 14 spaces uh, closest to the main entry of the building. And we will be using a parking sticker for people who have been assigned those spaces so that we can identify that they are residents. Um, and then um, there will be a, a guest um, possibility for stickers as well. Um, then there will be two handicap spaces that will be reserved for residents who do have a handicap parking sticker or placard. Um, tenants with a car registered in their name will be allowed to have a sticker and park on site and no household will be allowed more than one sticker. Regular staff working on site will also receive a, a parking sticker. That would include the site manager, the resident services coordinator, and maintenance staff um, on the hours that they're there. Cars in designated spaces without a parking sticker will be subject to towing. And then there are two spaces located farthest from the main entry that'll be available for visitors and guests who do not have a sticker. Um, but a visiting, but are visiting a, a resident. 
in the studio housing and those will be labeled. And then um, we would expect, now again, relatively speaking, maybe some higher usage of parking spaces in the evenings and weekends and staff usage during the days. And what, we, what we're illustrating this with, um, we've shown the site plans that show the, the um, actual um, uh, parking spaces. And this is a, a, for point of comparison and what we've based our planning on is that in SRO type of housing, we don't typically have residents with cars. Um, we have uh, a lot of residents who walk, who use the bus, who ride their bike, who use alternative transportation. And this is an example of Sergeant House, which you'll be seeing some more slides of in a moment. This is just completed construction. And at the Sergeant House, we have 31 units and 14 spaces. But at the Northampton proposed project, um, we are, oh, I don't have the, the count here and I am forgetting that. Um, it's a higher ratio of spaces per unit. Um, and I'm so sorry that I don't know that off the top of my head the number of spaces, um, but um, our plan is based on, uh, as I said, that we just don't typically utilize the parking spaces and we plan for enough that is based on a ratio of these residents having cars and then having spaces for staff and occasional guests. So this, so is, this is the written parking plan drafted as it is. There would be some more detail to it as it were on site. Any questions there? Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions. The first is, in your, it seems to me there's several factors that affect how much parking you need. Because if, if you don't have enough parking there, it's very difficult to park in the neighborhood for people that have cars. So that's, this may not be the same as other, other properties you manage. But in, the, in your experience um, for uh, these efficiency units, there's probably a difference in the needs, the number of people that have cars depending upon their the percentage of the of uh, adjusted median adjusted income in the area. That 30% or less probably are less likely to have cars, and 50% to 80% of median income are probably more likely to have cars. Um, those the examples you showed were they of uh, very very low income, low income, or 80% and uh, up to 80% income. The example here that I'm showing, um, yeah. I, I would, these have got uh, a similar um, tenant population to yeah. what we okay. are uh, planning for on 132 Northampton Road. There are tiers of income um, restrictions at this property that everyone is at 30% or 50% or below. I would say that in my experience that um, living in cities where there are, um, and we, Affordable housing is located near public transportation and um, it, there is not necessarily a correlation between the income level and whether folks have a car. Um, there are a lot of people who choose to not have that expense, even if they have some income to mm -hmm. support it. But I would so say this is a very comparable building at Sargent House um, to uh, the resident population that we're looking at. So you have um, 14 spaces for residents, correct? At the Sergeant House. No, but at, at 132 Northampton, you have 14 spaces for residents? I, I am, it, it, that's what I was 12. saying. I, I, I don't have that note in front of me, um, so. It was I'm, in the last slide, I think. Oh. Let's go back. Oh, you there 14, we go. Yeah, Thank you have 14 you. parking spaces. Yep. You have 14 parking spaces. You have... Um, and 28 the, units. 28 units, and I think you have 16. Do you have Do you have uh, 12 units that are at 50 or 80 percent? And what percentage of the people do you? How do you plan this out? There must be a formula you use to figure out how many parking spaces you need, and have you used that other places, or just kind of just it, experiential. It's you know, it's really, it's not, it's not so much that there's a formula. It's really just that it is very rare that in studio size housing, um, with a, in our family housing, we would typically see a car for every household. Mm -hmm. In SRO housing, we very, very rarely see that there is cars beyond, I would say, uh, 40 
to 50% of residents. Um, you know, that's going to be my best guess. Um, that's at a range of properties. Some of them would be in inner cities and um, where there's a whole different set of considerations. But really, as I'm saying, anytime that you're in the city, residents coming into these types of units are typically um, finding that the expense of having a bike, riding a bus, or utilizing other means of transportation and walking are the more common um, means of transportation. There isn't a formula that is income-based that we use. It's really just that, um, and this is a very typical question um, at uh, during development about parking and the capacity for parking. Um, but you know the the need for the housing um, in relation to the parking is based on that experience, so that we're not over paving uh, a site for sites for um, spaces that are not needed. Okay. I'd, I'd be happy to address, I'm not, you know, I'd be happy to address any concerns about the plan, but that would not be a formula that would be available. All right. Can I, can I make one clarification? Uh, we're providing 16 spaces, two of which are handicapped. So 16 spaces are available for residents. Oh, okay. So yeah. it's the 14 yeah. closest plus the two handicapped. Plus yeah. the two, right. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. Other questions regarding the parking plan? Yes, I have. Mr. Limesfield? Um, the Sergeant House that you showed us mm -hmm. um, as an example of the same kind of uh, uh, living uh, conditions um, is located on very flat ground. Uh, 132 Northampton is very hilly. Uh, so walking is going to be much more difficult, especially in the winter um, and in the summer like we've been having. Um, it's uh, 0.6 miles to the big Y, further to stop and shop, and then up the hill, coming back, it's the same distance, for carrying things, uh, and then going into town is very starkly uphill, um, and then coming down is, of course, downhill. But the people who take the bus have to walk up into town to catch the bus. Um, so I'm concerned about given that you're having that this is an SRO and that you're going to have people there who have uh, disabilities and problems, uh, physical, uh, emotional, that there is not, it doesn't seem to me that there is a plan for helping these people navigate this really strong hill to get uh, what they need in terms of uh, uh, food and other things. Um, I really would like to hear some, uh, to, to hear that uh, uh, talked about. Yeah, we will go into that in detail. Um, in the center of this parking plan, we mentioned that the staff working, um, the resident service coordinator position and property management on site, in a moment when we get to the resident services plan, we talk in great detail about the additional assistance that this resident service coordinator will give residents to work with their options around transportation. And I think it will address some of your concerns. Okay, we've, in the last, I believe it was the last uh, presentation, <clears throat> I brought this up and was told that the resident services coordinator will not be providing uh, transportation. Um, the uh, property management person will not be providing uh, transportation. So I still haven't heard anything about what kind of service will be available for people with disabilities, whatever they may be, in terms of uh, dealing with this uh, terrain. There's a PVTA, uh, this will be, I'm sorry if that was unclear. 
I'm, I was mentioning that the resident service coordinator, um, as mentioned in this plan, is, is, is staffed on site not to give rides or provide direct transportation, but the details related to the um, transportation services that are available to people with special needs is outlined in the upcoming section related to resident services coordination. Okay. We could add that to the parking plan. Let's leave, it in, the res leave it in the services. Yeah, I think that's where it belongs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ms. O'Meara, you had your hand up. Thank you. Just to piggyback that idea is um, if those two handicap spots are occupied, if there's a wheelchair van coming to pick up or transport a patient to a client to a medical appointment, where will they park? That's another question. Mm-hmm. I believe at the entry we have a an area that is going to have a um, the loading zone. Uh, yeah, there you go. Thank you, Rachel. It's a uh, nine feet wide, um, by twenty feet long. So, if you, that's another one of the case where you can come back to us with a drawing and a specific answer to Ms. Sonner's question for the next meeting. Well, I think, I think what we're saying, just we can bring a drawing back. I think what we're saying is that uh, a van picking someone up would not need a parking space, but would need a loading zone for a person to load and unload. And so um, the space, an additional space would not be necessary if those two spaces were, were full. But, but we're at the disadvantage of not seeing the plan in front of us. So just, yeah, just, okay. pro yeah, just yep. provide a piece of paper, a plan Absolutely. with and show us where the van would go, that Absolutely. would be the right the way to solve that problem, I think, or at least okay. answer the question. Great. Okay. All right. All right. Any other, any other questions? Yeah. All right, let's move on. All right. Um, so then the board asked for some photographs of some similar low-income housing projects that um, would be comparable, and we do have some interior and exterior building photographs that we'd like to share here. <clears throat> this is the uh, recently com uh, completed construction Sargent House on 82 Bridge Street in Northampton. As we mentioned, 31 studio apartments um, with kitchenettes and bathrooms, so very similar to the uh, unit configurations and sizes that we're proposing. This is the front uh, exterior shot of the building. We have a a few different takes on this to just sort of show you that um, this is some context with neighboring houses. This is the fence of the Sargent House and the Sargent House building. And then you can see the neighboring houses and the context there. And this is this uh, kind of pale cream colored house is on the opposite side. So here behind the trees, here's the fence here of Sargent House next to its other neighbor abutting. And then here is the, um, from that angle. Here's another shot of the front of the building. Um, here is the parking shot that I had showed earlier, um, uh, the front door, and then there are entries to the side. These are the common areas, um, are, are some common areas and uh, just a few features that are, um, you know, reminiscent of the plan that we brought to you for 132 Northampton Road. So this is the foyer. Here is the um, built um, bike storage area. Um, and here's another shot of the parking. Here are some interior units. And again, the, the unit size comparable to what we have proposed. Here's a kitchenette, a little detail of a sink. So you see a fridge, stove and microwave, cabinets, uppers and lowers, and then um, Here's the living area, a couple of community space, um, some restoration of existing um, fireplaces that were in the building that we did, some sitting areas for residents. Here's an occupied unit just to um, show some commenters have been concerned about sizes of units and how they're occupied. Here's a resident who just uh, moved in, was a resident in the past and moved back into a unit at Sargent House. So here's the kitchenette area, here's a bathroom. Um, this shows uh, you know, a small table, a bed, 
a couch. So this is um, how this unit, how this resident has set up their unit. This is another property that Valley owns. It's called Valley Go West in uh, Florence. This has some commercial space downstairs and upstairs, 17 studio apartments with kitchenettes and bathrooms. Again, very similar. Um, this was built a while ago, um, but it has the kitchenette area. And then um, here's a common area, another interior shot. King Street in Northampton. This is 10 studio apartments. Um, so again, just a couple of shots of exterior and interior to give you some ideas of um, the way that these units look. This is on Maple Street in Florence. These are 11 single rooms with one shared kitchen, so not a direct comparable unit, but just another, um, another property in our portfolio that um, houses single independent living residents. Um, so those are the comparables. Are there any questions on that? Uh, yes, on the Valley Go West, the kitchen photograph, back up one, or go further. No, yeah, okay, that's fine. The one of the kitchenette on the left side, what is the door next to the refrigerator? This door here? Yeah. This is a closet. This is the entry door here, and then this is a storage closet. Okay. Um, does uh, 137, 132 Northampton, do they have the same kind of closet? Um, I, I, I wouldn't, um, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Langsdale, that I don't have Laura's depth of understanding of the layouts. I don't know that it would be this type of closet, but for instance, I, I'm trying to see if we have some closet shots here in these units. These have some bifolding um, at, at the sergeant house. One of them is not in an interior shot, but we have bifold doors with a closet for storage. Where are they? Um, they're in different locations because each of these units is different uh, mm -hmm. layout, but sometimes you would come in. So here you would come in from the left, you'd be entering this door that you can see the opening of is the bathroom but the closet is right here in the um, doorway, the little foyer area that walks into this main room. If I, if I could, I, I do remember this being discussed before and I think the architect uh, from whom is it? I think one of the I'm, architects. Yeah, I'm here. Can, speak uh, to that. can you, we did, is that Mr. Chalm Chalmers? Yeah, I, I'm here. I don't have a camera at the moment, sorry. Um, yeah, we did talk about it before, and we we do we do not for the a few of the units do, but most of them do not have a full separate closet. We have uh, cabinet built closets. Mm. So it is it is it is definitely cabinet. it's different than that space. They're the kitchen cabinets, correct? Well, it's a it's a cabinet like it's not a kitchen cabinet. It's, it's a closet, but it's built out of out of cabinet materials, not um, a stud wall and drywall. Well, how, how is it big enough to hang? Things? Yes, yes, it's like a, it's like it's the same, it, it's the same depth. It's twenty four inches deep. It's similar to what you might call a pantry closet, height? except it's height. the same height. Is it? It goes up to the top of the same well, height I, as you I have, see. I haven't seen that on any of the uh, proposals for one thirty two. So I'd, I'd like well, to see that. Yeah. Well. I think what we have in the drawings thus far is they're, they're design drawings, early design drawings, and they show it in plan, but we don't have elevations of the kitchens. Okay, so. Okay, well, I, we, I would like to see elevations because otherwise we're gonna go over this again until you come up with elevations. So we can produce, I mean, that would be helpful. I see it on those the top down views where the closets are on some of the units for 132, but there's nothing that shows the height. So um, that would, that would be helpful. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, right. yeah, we, yeah, we can do that. Okay. Um, uh, other questions regarding the, the comparable units? Uh, one more. What is the square footage of these uh, apartments? 
Uh, these, I believe, are about 150. There's a range of sizes, but I think the average is right around 150 square feet. And that compares to what at 132? 180 um, square feet at 132? 230. So um, at 132, we have an average, we have, uh, an average of two, a low of 230 and a high of 266 for standard units. And it's just under 400 square feet for the accessible unit, fully accessible unit. Thank you. I'm sorry. These are just stats that I'm getting up to speed. But I know you're doing the job. Thank you, though. Yep. yep. Oh. All right. Uh, next, any other questions on comparable units? If not, um, go ahead, Ms. Leckler. Okay. Excuse me, I mispronounced your name. Ms. Leckler. Leckler. Very good. Thank you, Steve. So now we, um, the questions were about some further construction details on the um, dumpster area, the storage shed, um, and the bike storage shed, and the smoking pavilion. These are some preliminary drawings. And um, just so I don't put my foot in it too much, uh, <laughs> um, I'm just going to make sure I keep this very open. Um, I'll show the slides and make sure that um, Tom doesn't have anything to add. Um, these are some exterior, um, very small exterior buildings to facilitate. Uh, the dumpster enclosure is not is not pictured here, um, but the dimensions are 8.2 feet by 17.2 feet, so large enough for an eight by six eight uh, and six yard dumpster. And then um, here's the storage shed, which is just a small standing shed, um, eight by eight feet with a poured concrete pad. All right, I see no questions. Okay. And then um, we did show the bike storage shed last time. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we're good there. And the dimensions were on the bike storage shed slides, I know. <clears throat> And then at this point, the um, proposed structure from June 25th, again, preliminary, but the smoking pavilion dimensions here we have are, so we have a, a prefabbed um, pavilion with the roof on it. So 5.7 feet deep by eight feet long. We have the roof dimensions and the base dimensions, seven foot by five foot, five, inch approximately. I see no questions. Okay. Great. Now the question here was that we um, bring the site plan to show all lot and building coverages for the RG and ED zoning districts. I don't know that I can make this bigger on my screen. I know that it is some, oh, I can. I, um, so here we've got, now I'm gonna be out of my depth here. So I don't know if Rachel or uh, Tom, if this is something you could describe, I think Laura would do well, but. Sure. Um, can you describe, or who can do this best? Uh, Rachel can. Okay. Um, the lot, yeah, the lot has two zones on it. Um, the majority of the lot is the RG zone, which is where the building is being placed um, and where the parking is falling. There, are, There is a little L-shaped uh, sliver on, on the Amherst College side um, that is in the ED zone, which is a little over 1,600 square feet, but the majority of the parcel is in the RG zone. Um, so the, the ED zone is that green? Yeah, the green color shown there. All right. there. Any questions? All right. Yeah, I have yes. a question, but I don't yes, know. Yes, Mr. Langsdale. Okay. Uh, dealing what? with the, the smoking pavilion, um, on this... Uh, dimensional chart it says new five eight by eight foot 
smoking pavilion with bench. The picture you showed did not have a bench. Um, then there's the question of, it's only 18 feet from the property line, and uh, it's supposed to be, I believe, 25 from any building, and it's 11 feet from the building, and uh, that puts it about five or maybe six feet from what is the garden uh, planting area. So if you get five or six people in there smoking 11 feet from the building and you've got four or five people in the garden working, the smoke is uh, <laughs> overwhelming, I would say. Is there another place on the property for this smoking pavilion which is not so close to the uh, building and or uh, outdoor areas? Um, have you looked at other areas and what have you considered and uh, what have you found? Um, do you want me to take this one, Jane? No, I know, I know, I know some about it, but go ahead, Rachel, please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I will say what, one of the big considerations on the project is just how the, how the residents um, will interface with the neighbors and also um, how we can retain the front character of the of the house to the street. Um, so we were the area on site that we have the most space is in the front, but that is that is also the area that has the most visibility from the road. Um, and a smoking pavilion in the front of the building would not look like a residence. Um, and then at Amherst College, you know, as we get further to the back corner of the site where the where the courtyard is, um, that gets closer to Amherst College um, area, and also that's the biggest usable space for for residents who want some privacy outdoor area. Um, so we wanted to preserve that area for people who were not smoking and wanting to hang out um, outside, um, and then as we get to the other side of the site where the parking area is um, and, the, and the neighbor is currently being proposed to be screened by trees and fencing, um, you know, th that also seems that our area becomes quickly congested with our, our bike covered bike storage and our um, turnaround area for dumpsters and service vehicles. Um, so it, it is a tight site for placing a, a pavilion. Um, and Jane, I'll let you weigh in also. Mm -hmm. Well, I would ask if if you've considered uh, moving the pavilion to the f uh, the north side of the building. You have a row of trees there that it could be in f uh, behind those trees, um, and f which puts it much further away from the building and further away from the walkway. Uh, because the, at the moment the pavilion is right up next to the walkway for anyone walking past there. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the fact that it is on the north side, which you consider the front of the building, uh, and you say there's not enough uh, uh, cover there, then perhaps what you need to do is consider what ways you can cover that pavilion if you move it to the north side of the building, which would put it much further away from the building and not anywhere near uh, any anyone else, including the walkway. Yeah. We do want to provide accessible pathway to the smoking area, so we do need some sort of paved surface to it. Um, and then also that front lawn area, I should also mention, is serving as our stormwater management area. So it's a depressed area that will be very wet and squishy um, during heavy rains. Um, <clears throat> okay. And then uh, I, was, I saw that Ms. Hardy had her hand up. Okay. Um, did you wish to speak? Mr. Chairman, I, I was actually going to um, address an issue about the RD and ED zones, and we've moved on to that from that. So if, if you're not interested in, in a comment on that, I, I can hold off. But I just had one thing to say about, about those two zones. Uh, proceed. Just give us a quick, your quick thoughts on it. Yes, I just wanted to point out to the board that um, the zoning bylaw states that it is presumed 
that the edge of the ED district follows the property line. Um, so the fact that this parcel is zoned both uh, as a residential zone and, an e and also in the ED district is a little bit of an anomaly. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. Any further comments? Yeah, if you put the, uh, the smoking pavilion north of the building, uh, you can add a path that goes directly to it. And the path would be only for those people going to and from the pavilion. As it is now, people, the path goes behind the pavilion and is the part of the main walkway. So people have to go past the, if they are going in those directions, they have to pass the smoking pavilion. Um, I, I, I would think that uh, we would recommend that you in, uh, investigate what needs to be done to move the pavilion to the north, because where it is now is, to me, unacceptable. Um, and what happens if uh, Amherst at some point goes smoke-free? Um, if this is to be a smoke-free uh, area, um, the pavilion to have one, I think, needs to be in the remotest location to all sides concerned. Um, and, and I, as I said, it's, to me, it's unacceptable where it is now. Uh, and I would like to see uh, some uh, investigation into how it can be moved or if it needs to be there at all. Uh, well, I will say that certainly we can investigate that further. I know a lot of deliberations have been done to find the right location on the site for a pavilion. I will say that it is um, more and more common and certainly something that Valley is um, willing to do is to make it a smoke-free smoke -free site um, and and to remove the pavilion for that reason. Um, uh, so we can come back with those, with that option as well as any possible other location on the site, um, but we will bring back any um, known um, concerns or issues such as something like the retention air, water retention area or any other concerns that have prevented us from putting it elsewhere. I think the way to resolve this is to come up with uh, two or three options drawn on, a, on the site plan, list the pros and cons, and the board can decide whether it wants to make that a condition of the project or not. Okay. That sounds great, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, this is uh, additional um, information on the zoning. Um, we'll pause here to make sure that there are no questions. I'm not going to read all of the data on this slide. Um, I believe that the description of the site plan covered the, the questions, but I'm happy to see if others have. The one place you, if I'm, if I'm reading this correctly, the one place you exceed the zoning is the, is the maximum lot coverage for hard surfaces, right? Is if you're at 45.29 and the maximum is 40%. So you're right. looking for, to um, be relieved That's from that theory. limitation. Yep. And that's a lot of that's due to the parking that you have the hard service in the driveway because mm -hmm. your building is only 12.8%. Okay. Other, other questions? Other questions on this? Yeah, I have one. Um, I still don't understand why this is uh, designated two and a half stories when there, in fact, there are three stories to the building. I think Mr. Uh, the architect. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's a difference between floor and story. So the definition of, 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 of story that because it's built into a hill and if you look at the way the grade works out, the lowest floor counts as not, not a full story above grade. Um, so that that's where the half story come in. Yes, it's three floors, but technically the 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 way the grade average is that the lower floor is a story below grade. 
I understand about the grade, but you have apartments in that lower story. Right, but that's not part of the definition. It, it's not saying it's not a floor. It's just by definition in the building code and, and is that it's a story below grade. So it does not count as a full story in terms of what the building code is. So it can, I mean, you, it, it's, it, you can look at it as a, a question of semantics. There, is, there are three floors, three occupied floors. Mr. Chalmers, it's, it's the only way that, that could be called a three-story building is if you raise it up by half of, uh, by six or eight feet, so that it would then well, be I'm not quite sure the ground. The, I'm not sure what the number is, but... But you'd have to raise it's the, a, the whole It's a building itself. code definition of right. story. And that comes into play in mostly in, in, a, in a code analysis of the building. But yes, it's three floors. Okay. I would also add that the height, the mean height, is less than the than the limit that's in the in the zoning bylaws. But the maximum, well, you're, the maximum height is above the. Height well, there isn't the maximum point. height. There's the, the zoning bylaws has a has a mean roof height is what it is what it gives. It doesn't list the maximum height for the roof. It's, the mean height is calculated based on the maximum and. Right. Uh, I remember I saw a drawing that had this on it. We can. Yeah, there's been a couple of drawings, and and it's not yeah. in this package, but there's there's one in the original set, and then there's one in the slide in the original and, slide presentation. And it has all the the heights. And it has all the heights. others in, in the neighborhood, if I recall yep. correctly. Yep. Okay. All so right. Are we, are we going to get that then? Well, you you already have that. I think in a couple of places. I think it's in the original <laughs> submission. It's in the first. Um, packet, the first PowerPoint that was submitted, and it's also in the, I think it's in the second uh, PowerPoint submission also. Thank you. It's in the plans here, and uh, I'm sure we can find it. All right. Mr. Um, Chair, Mr. Yes. Chair uh, Ms. Brestrup has raised her hand. Yes. Ms. Brestrup. Just, hello, thank you. I just wanted to, um, Chris Brestrup, Planning Director, point out that three floors, three stories are allowed in this zoning district. So it's sort of, in terms of zoning, it doesn't really matter whether it's right. called two and a half or three stories because three stories are allowed. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Uh, let's go on to the next subject. Um, the board had asked for some additional photographs to um, illustrate the line of trees along the driveway um, and from the college and then from our Orchard Street and abutting properties. We have several here. I will try to increase the size a little if that increases on your screen. Um, so this is 132 Northampton Road at the, uh, this is this is coming into the site. Here's the line of trees. Here's our neighbor and the existing houses behind the trees. Here's the front yard. Again, driveway of the house, existing trees, the existing um, building behind the um, pole here. This is from the um, Amherst College parking lot. So, oh, so here's those spaces, the Amherst fence, and then the site over here. This is a picture of the, um, the tree line. And then I believe that this is the, um, the tall hedge at the center of the yard. for lack of better description. Um, here's the existing building. So um, the east facade, these are from the north facade, two different views, uh, two different angles. Here we've got from the south and southwest facade, looking from the Amherst Field, from Pratt Field. This is looking from the site to the field house. This is um, Northampton Road 
at the um, standing right at the front of the lot. So looking east toward University Drive, looking west towards Amherst Center. Here's the abutting house at 126 Northampton Road. And there are multifamily private residences on uh, nearby on no Northampton Road. Excuse me, the, the pictures you had before uh, going into Amherst is uh, east and west toward University Drive. Okay, we'll correct that. All right, I see no raised and hands. And then here's some additional street views. This is um, this is from Northampton Road, looking at Dana Street, from Woodside, looking towards the college. This is Orchard Street, Woodside Avenue again, the other direction, Orchard Street, and Hitchcock Road from Prattfield. And I believe there's, well, oh no, I guess that's the last one. All right. I see no questions. Move on. Okay. Um, there was a question, um, a request for section elevations along uh, Route 9. Um, they, these are beyond the scope of design. Um, the cost would be um, outside of um, our scope um, and from a time perspective as well, if it were not even only for the cost, would take a, a great deal of time. We did want to bring some information, which is about the change in elevation along Northampton Road. So this is just measuring from the corner of University in Northampton and then at 132. So the difference, there's a change in 86 feet and over this distance. So then we're giving you the average grade from that, di from that direction. And then we're doing the same measurement from the property to South Pleasant and Northampton Road, a change of 47 feet over a distance of 1,771. So then we've got um, your average grade of 2.94%. Then you've got the measure from University and Northampton Road, the Southeast corner, same as above, to the intersection of Pleasant and Northampton Road. So that's um, a change of 133 feet, average grade of 3.2%. Ms. Leckler, what's the grade that's used to um, by, by the ADA as an accessible grade for a hand, person in a wheelchair or other handicap? What is um, that? So that would be, um, for anything that does not require a ramp, that would be 5%. Would be so, 5%. Yeah, so these are under five. Well, of course, there's probably going to be places along them where it's not, this is yeah. an average, but right, but it's under 5%. I'm just trying to understand how that compare, how the walk into downtown or the walk back up from University Drive would compare to what's required for the ADA. Yeah. And I know and it's an average and it varies, but I'm just trying to get a sense of that. 2% two, two is what's generally used for a flat area either at a, a landing or a parking area. So you have anywhere from 2 to you know, obviously it's over 2%, but, it, but but an average of under four is not not extreme. And, and while that may be the case, I walk that often and I find that I'm out of breath on the way up to the, to the top of the hill at times. So it's not a, an insignificant grade, even though it's beneath the, uh, the, also, the limits. Also, I would like to say that it, it may be under the average grade, average grade, for uh, a wheelchair, person in a wheelchair, but what is the grade for someone walking for over half a mile with packages in their hand? Up a grade that's 3.67%. Uh, uh, I mean, that's, that's where, for me, we, we're, uh, we're kind of skirting the issue of, you know, it's it's not that bad if you just walk it. But if you if you're handicapped and if you have to carry packages, uh, it's a significant 
grade. And I think it's important for us to discuss that because the uh, places that you've shown us in Northampton are flat and therefore much easier for people to get around in. Plus, this doesn't take into account how far one has to go to get on a bus to go to the places that you want to or need to go. Um, I just think it's this is a very important point. It's one that merits further discussion. We will have that. So here is some um, further detail on the uh, um, accessibility slopes. So the zero to two percent that I think Tom was just describing. Tom, do you want to talk through this any further, or would the board members like to hear further? at this level of um, technical detail, or um, is it more the discussion that Mr. Langsdale described? Um, I, I think we, I think this is a, will be valuable to have when we have a further discussion on accessibility, on services, on transportation. And I, those are all gonna be wrapped up, I think, in your supportive services presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this is an important part. I want, we wanna make sure we address that because the real question is accessibility for, for the residents not mm -hmm. just the, the definitions of slopes and grades and yep. accessible, okay? Okay, great. Um, uh, a request here was for a detailed section um, and a 3D model. Uh, these are both beyond the scope for the design team, um, both scope and um, cost. So we are not able to provide those, unfortunately. I understand the desire. Now, so let's just go back to that for a second. The, the question here, I didn't request this, but I want to help whoever did. Uh, please provide detailed section showing height from Orchard Street and the entry. Did you have pictures that did that? The, the original uh, the submission that was filed with you did have a, um, a sheet that had views, com photographs compiled along the street that gave... Um, that showed each, it was a photograph of each house and they were spread out along the street so to see the relative, you could see the kind of vague, you know, relative heights of the, of the different okay. buildings. And it was, um, and a lot of the difference had to do with what the setback from the street was obviously right. because of the perspective. Um, it didn't show, it didn't show the slope because it was presented flat horizontally but obviously the ones uphill would be higher than the ones downhill. I think what's incumbent upon us is to recognize two things. Number one, that we need, we need the information we need to get the, to be able to make the, a vote and decide on this. At the same time, we um, ought to prioritize that which we think is most important because at some point these do become um, very expensive for the applicant and may, uh, may be something that, that could render that maybe more than we should be asking for. So I think what we should do is as a board decide what is the most important. If there are uh, designs that, that uh, you feel are beyond your scope that we really think we need to have, we should discuss that amongst the board members and decide what that is. And we can um, deal with the, the consequences of that. But I, I think we have to be aware that these things cost money and um, only ask for that which is most important to our decision making. So it'd be helpful for us to, and Moraine, if you would, I, there'll be there'll be other cases where we ask for um, drawings, 3D models, other things. We should keep them in a. Um, um, we should collect those so we can judge which ones are most important, if any, that we want to ask the applicants to fulfill. Sure. Okay. All right. Understood. Uh... Also, I think it would be helpful to us if there is maybe an alternative to a request that would be costly from a design standpoint, but maybe there is some way we could enhance um, the photographs that Tom just described or something like that. So well, if, you can, if you can come up with some things that'd be helpful um, and then we don't have to make a decision on that item. But, but you know, I think it's, it's important if we, the point in this, I think would be the building height and, and, and the building height is, you know, does comply, the, both the building height and the number of stories does comply with the, with the zoning 
regulations. So it's, it's not that it's exceeding uh, what is allowed. I understand. And it is set back far from the street. It's also not up in front of the street. But I understand the desire for members to see what it, have an idea what it would feel like if it, once it's sited and once it's constructed. And um, so we'll have to figure out how we can do that. And, and maybe it's just another site visit. So let's move on to the next, to the next thing. We're, we're excuse using me. up a lot of time excuse here. Me. I'm sorry, Steve. Mr. 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 Langsdale. Given what has just been said, um, I would propose that the board members, the people from the CDC and Mr. Ch uh, Chalmers take that walk from University Drive all the way up into Amherst. That way we get, is that's the only way we're going to get a sense of what that, what that uh, grade really is and, and what effort it takes to go up that, uh, that hill. Uh, the pictures flatten it out. Uh, pictures just don't. That's why there was a uh, there's a request for a detailed sex and showing. So my proposal is that we before the next meeting we choose a time and together we all walk up that hill. Um, and that's my. I, can I say one thing? Yeah, I, no, we'll just deal with it this way, Keith. I, I understand it. I walk that a lot. I'm not going to. I, I don't want to entertain a question to force members to do that, um, but I think people should should go out and take a look at it, and if they can, they should walk it. I walk it. I walk it often, and I know it's a it's a hike up that hill. Yeah, I, I just want to add, just for clarification, the intent of those drawings that we submitted was not um, to address the slope of the hill or the difficulty of the walk. It was looking at the relative buildings on the site. Yeah. So it, had, it, it was not trying to minimize, we, we presented it, it was not mi presented to minimize the slope or the walk, or it was looking at the, trying to compare the building's heights relative to other buildings. But we also were talking, in the earlier slide, we were talking about right. the, the slope. Yep. So, yeah, we understand. Okay. All right. Next. All right, so uh, the next request was to uh, do a summary of the property management plan. This is a summary of the plan that um, with some additions uh, to, you know, what is, uh, the, the plan that was submitted was a, um, a format that um, I believe was requested um, in, the, in the application package. I've added some additional information that has to do with our known relationship and daily business of running property management at affordable housing sites. So the summary is that we would have on-site property management staff, on-site approximately 20 hours per week. Um, housing management resources is our intended uh, property management agent supervising the site staff. They have been a manager for Valley for multiple properties uh, since 2016. They've got a great reputation um, they're a multi-state property management company. They've been in business since 2001, over 8,000 units. They maintain a 24-7 call service to respond to resident and site emergencies, and they have a local office in Northampton. Typically, the duties of site management um, include rent collection. There's compliance with our regulatory agencies, which include our funding sources. Um, making sure that uh, residents are, and applicants are income eligible and making sure that we are adhering to the standards of decent, safe, and sanitary housing, and then scheduling a maintenance and resident relations um, related to the business of um, leases and um, residents' uh, behaviors. Um, so, so I think that one of the things, if I may, one of the things we will do is we want to look at your map, your, you've amended your your management plan. Is that correct? We have not this amended it. It's just that the plan that was requested for our for the for the um, for the application, there's a there's what's is is requesting sort of some um, some information that is 
this question came out of what the staffing, as I understood it, I was there when the conversation was happening. So we were interpreting the question to mean, what is property management going to do on site? I don't have the actual, I could pull it up, but it would take a minute. I've got it in the background. Um, the plan that was submitted with the application was in response to a format that outlined a lot of things that had to do with overall property factors. Mm -hmm. um, so, but go ahead, Mr. Chairman. I'm, no, I'm, I was just trying to say that if, that if you've submitted something new, we should look, one of the things we will do is we will look at the management plan. And um, so if you, if, if you could just, if this is the highlights of your, of the response to the question, that's great, but we don't want to go through the whole management plan tonight. No, no, this is okay. just two slides. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so 20 hours a week, the staffing plan um, does exceed the typical industry standard, which is in affordable housing, a half an hour of staff time per unit per week. So that would be 14 hours per week. We wanted to make sure that we had adequate staffing to make sure that the residents and the property maintenance is being done um, adequately and, and then some. And then um, asset management is a part of the property management plan that would be provided by Valley CDC as owner. The difference between property management and asset management is that asset management is a longer term view for operations of the property to make sure that there is um, financial health and that capital needs and improvements are being planned for. So some examples of an asset management role would be that um, we would be on site doing regular site visits and inspections of units, um, exterior, mechanicals, et cetera, um, advise property management on best practices, review for, um, review their uh, management practices. We would handle lender and funder communications. We would ongoing review financials and operating data. And then we would also um, oversee and participate in the resident experience and neighborhood relations as owner. So that's a, that's a recap of um, what was submitted. And it's not an additional plan, just to clarify, Mr. Chairman, what you were just mm -hmm. asking, so much as um, just some additional facts of, of what we know our relationship with HMR is. If there's an additional uh, request, we'd be happy to um, provide more detail on this particular topic. Good. Okay. No, I have nothing else on that. Right. And then um, we have a few more sections here. This is a um, this is a one aspect. So we are going to go into further detail. This was the request. The request made uh, was to provide a summary of the supportive services plan and an explanation about how the proposed development is intended for independent living, not a group home. And then the roles and responsibility of the resident services coordinator. Since this question was posed, we changed the agenda tonight to spend more time. So what I'm going to do here is just focus really quickly on the points about the proposed development um, and the definition in relation to supportive services. And then we can go into more detail about the entire plan um, at the, after we finish this presentation. Um, so this distinction, this is a summary of the, the main points of the plan that we submitted. Um, it's 35 pages in the package, but uh, it describes Valley's approach to providing a resident services coordinator. The acronym, which is commonly used in the industry is RSC for that role. Um, it describes referrals of residents for set aside units. The plan describes the role of the resident service coordinator on site, the hours of that staff person and job description. The plan describes after hours access to services. It describes our community partners and then um, some facilities and uh, services that in proximity to the site. It describes transportation options and how our resident service coordinator would help residents with that. It describes community integration um, and then we are also adding again later our research and development process for the plan. And then we just have a brief mention again later of the tenant selection plan and screening. That's a summary of what is included. Um, and mm -hmm. that is, um, we'll come back to more detail on that. What we wanted to clarify in response to the board's question here, specific to um, the definition and tenant population 
is that the federal and state funding sources for this that we are anticipating for this project require that all units are used for permanent and non-transient housing. This is an important distinction for many of the concerns and questions that are coming up around the services. There are no HUD loans, there's no project-based Section 8 or other funding sources that bind the project to provide direct on-site case management. There is no requirement for 24-hour services because the site is not a direct care facility. So there are no regulatory requirements for on-site services or 24-7, but Valley has elected and responded to concerns in the neighborhood um, but we elected from the beginning because we know that a resident service coordinator helps our residents and helps the property to function well. Um, so these proper, these units are set up as apartments for independent living. So all participation in the services and the coordination services is voluntary for the residents. There are other resident service models that are not comparable to what we're proposing because these facilities do have different regulatory and um, standard regulatory requirements and standards that exist to describe what is required. So these are not, um, with all respect to these facilities and their residents and their staff, um, 132 Northampton Road would not be any of these, a federal or state administered direct care facility. It is not a congregate living or treatment site. It is not a residential behavior health facility. It is not assisted living for elderly or disabled persons. Um, and it is not transitional housing, a group home or a halfway house. So we wanted to make sure that these types of examples would make it clear that independent living for residents, even with the um, referred services, is a different model than any of these. So our approach here is that um, coordination and access to community services as a common best practice for mission-based affordable housing providers like, our, like Valley CDC often opt to provide residents, and this is available to all residents, with the benefits that come with having a resident service coordinator on site. This again, and we're gonna go into more detail of the plan, but in summary, this person helps residents connect with outside agencies and support networks that help them with financial education, self-sufficiency, health or wellness centers. Um, some residents opt to use this and others do not. Some residents have caseworkers, which we'll talk about um, uh, later in the detail. This resident service coordinator also plans and organizes activities that encourage a social atmosphere amongst residents as neighbors um, to each other and to the neighborhood. And then um, this person also enhances uh, an environment of peaceful enjoyment for all community members supporting the strength and stability of not only the residents experience, but also financial oper operations because it helps residents to um, maintain their units and pay their rent on time. So that's the summary. Um, I, I don't want to stop any questions here, but I believe Mr. Chairman, you let's want delay to- them to, Yeah, let's delay the questions on supportive services until after you've completed it. Yep. Yep. Um, there was the question about um, explaining how much storage is available, and this um, came up earlier, so we'll just really quickly um, show the dimensions here um, in written form. So the closet here, two and a half feet by four and a half feet by seven and a half feet high. Um, and then, um, then we've got the refrigerator storage space, a medicine cabinet in the bathroom, um, and a second bathroom wall cabinet. The kitchen layout is still being designed, but uh, anticipating 48 inches of base cabinets, 24 inches of full wall cabinets, and a 30 inch cabinet above the fridge, as well as a 24 inch cabinet above the microwave. Any questions on, further questions on storage? Okay, let's move on. Um, there was a request for a list of job types at the various income levels. 
And so um, what we did here was we went out and looked on some um, job seeking sites and looked at what was available um, in the area just to give some examples and hopefully, you know, there would be some familiarity with um, some of the companies that are listed here. Um, it was a, a rather open question. So I'm just gonna show what we pulled together, but we wanted to also bring in an example of the types of income at hourly rates, Working a person working part-time at this hourly rate would make $12,000, 480 a year, and that would be 21% of the AMI, full-time 24,960, that would be at 42%. And then this just shows their monthly gross earnings. So this helps to sort of get a sense of translating the AMI into hourly rates, part-time or full-time. And then here are the restrictions at 30 and 50 and 80% to compare to these charts. Here are some of the job descriptions and postings that we found. Um, this was a while back. Uh, so we have kitchen staff, um, a lot of, uh, you know, support and um, janitorial um, uh, types of work. This was a seasonal summer job. This was at Big Y working as, um, there were stock, um, stockers and inventory clerks. Um, so those are some of the examples that we found. And briefly, you have kitchen staff from 14 to $18 an hour. What is the seasonal summer labor amount? $14, um, nine, $14 an hour, $12.87 to $14.99. Yeah. Big Y, um, overnight stocker is what? The overnight stocker, I don't, they don't, that one oh, says 20, 21 to 34 per year, so but that's a zip recruiter estimate. Yeah. That's not a part of the posting. Okay. So it gives us a feeling. If you just go back one quick, sure. one slide. Well, I guess one, one more. We don't have, there's no, um, this is just what's available. This is not a, you don't have the wages associated with these positions do you or is are they all below? no this was this was a posting that showed a list of um just available jobs yeah okay thank you mm -hmm. okay so then um this was a question uh about the proposed budget um, and uh, we will show that in a moment um, but the question was just about how much revenue comes from rent, from grants, how much of their revenue goes to building expenses and how much to Valley CDC overhead. Um, what would happen if the project, um, if what would happen to the project if state or federal government changed the levels of housing support? Would the project stay in business? And the question was asking for some reassurance of what would happen if Valley CDC should go broke and what would happen, um, what would the town be responsible for? Um, there was also a question that uh, related to abutters asking about some apartments for families and what would happen to the economics of the project if there were family apartments. And that would definitely reduce the SRO units. So I, I'm, we are going to spend, um, a, if not a whole session, at least a significant part of a session talking about the finances and the budget. Okay. And I think that this is, I've gone through this. I think this is valuable. It's insightful. And I don't want to, to dismiss um, the question. It's a good one. Both questions are good ones. But um, I think this is something you should have avail available for us when we discuss the finances of the project. And that will be at, uh, at a time in the next couple of meetings. And Absolutely. Going over it briefly tonight and then um, spending the time doing that and not dealing in de detail on it. So that let's makes move sense. on to, let's, yep. we have this in our packets. It's, it's material Great. we've got and we can look at it. So just go ahead and just, uh, just uh, next. would you like me to say anything or just continue? Okay. So the, the, the two budgets are, the first budget here is uh, the construction budget and the second budget is an operating budget forecast. So we okay. can uh, go into that later. Yep. Okay. Um, these were some points. Do you want to um, continue that to that um, future discussion as, as well, Mr. Chairman? These are related to the budget and answering the questions that were posed. I'm just looking through the materials. This is all about, this all deals with the, how, you, how these are financed and That's right. 
the subsidies and let's I think this is part of the next that uh, makes sense to me from what you time. just said. Yep. 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 Okay. All right. So then that concludes where we were at um until we move on to the supportive services. So I just put a pause here. Um but I can continue moving as well. Ms. Parks, did you raise your hand or were you just stretching? Okay. All right. Um, let's go to the supportive services plan now. And if, if I may, I think that what we should do is allow you to run through this with being aware of the time we have. It's 8.15. We try to be done at nine o'clock. I don't think we're gonna make that tonight, um, but I'd like to get as close to that as we possibly can. Um, so run through and then we will have we will have questions at the end of your presentation, as Great. opposed to interrupting you during the course of it. Let's let you do provide it. And then I'd ask board members to write down your questions, make notes on the supportive services uh, paper that you got and um, we can ask, I'll make sure that we can ask questions after it's um, done, unless it's purely for a clarifying purpose. Okay. And then go I ahead. believe um, uh, I, will go, I will run through the slides. Um, thank you for that uh, guidance. And um, John Hornick is on the line as one of our advisors on this plan. And he does have a very short statement that he would like to add just to describe um, from his experience and professional opinion, a couple of points that would take uh, about three minutes. Okay, Mr. Hornick, identify yourself, please. He may not be quite queued up because he knows he would come at the end, but. Oh, hold on one second. I need to. Um... Oh, he's at the end. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 he just raised his, you wanted him to speak now or later? No, he would speak afterwards. I just wanted to make it clear that when I get to my last slide that we were going to have John just present a quick statement that he's. All right. Okay, sure. Okay, he can identify himself then. Okay, great. All right. So here what we've done is, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, is we're describing supportive services and we're gonna go into more detail here that gets at I think some of the concerns that have been brought up by public comment and the board members. I already went through this slide. That's the same um, bullet points earlier that was the summary of the plan. So I'm just gonna go ahead right into each topic. Um, Again, Valley, this is a repeat of what I described that Valley does bring um, a resident service coordinator to the project to provide these overall benefits, but we'll now go into some of the details of how that works in our experience. And again, as is common in affordable housing, um, long-term um, permanent affordable housing, um, such as the project proposed. Um, be, we're going to start with what happens with the residents for, we have the homeless set aside units that have been a topic um, and have been presented previously. So for 10 homeless set aside units, there's a process of referring agencies who identify candidates that they are already working with who would be a good candidate, a good fit for independent living. So those referring agencies, um, and those will be listed shortly, um, would identify applicants who would come and be screened under the property selection criteria to fill those uh, homeless set aside units. The referred residents are operating under agreement with their referring caseworkers who are service providers. And this is the distinction just to um, educate the nuance of this in our industry. A service provider is directly providing services, whereas our resident service coordinator is coordinating residents to connect with those types of service providers. But for these 10 referred um, uh, previously homeless applicants, they would be working with an individualized service plan. And this is a clip from our resident service plan that just describes a typical individualized plan that is created to identify the needs for each of these individuals. Um, and they are addressing areas such as maintaining successful tenancy, um, securing or improving educational or employment um, goals, maintaining or improving behavioral or physical health, improving financial and asset management skills, increasing community connections and supports, and including measurable goals and outcomes in their individual plans. Many of these 
bullet points mirror similar goals that our resident service coordinator brings, the difference between these referred applicants and residents is that they have an agreement to work with their caseworkers on this. So they have services being provided there outside of the site. So the resident service coordinator also offers that additional presence of that for not only these residents who might you know, find some additional connections there, but for all residents to engage with these types of uh, services in the community. So the resident service coordinator serves all residents in that capacity. So it includes those who are under those external case management relationships, um, but they provide overarching guidance to help build community and to set expectations for residents to remain in good standing. We may have residents who are not referred, but are recovering from homelessness, either in their past or um, immediately, who meet our selection criteria. But if we find that residents have not yet established a relationship with a service provider and they would want one, that is of course something that a resident service coordinator brings to the table to introduce them to those staff at those agencies so they can build that relationship. The resident service coordinator hours um, would the original plan provided for 20 hours a week in response to the concerns of neighbors? Uh, we voluntarily increased the number of hours to 27 and a half to 30 hours per week to reassure the community that we have a concern for our resident success and we also have a concern for uh, the community and for neighborhood safety. Um, there are no regulatory requirements. And this number of hours is far and beyond what is typical for a resident, for the size of property and for this resident population. Um, by handling these tasks, the RSC will allow property management staff to focus on operations, maintenance, grounds, and their administrative duties. We wanted to provide a um, comparison to some known properties that Valley is either owner of or a uh, uh, co-general partner in, or and then just a couple of other um, properties in the area, where you can see by the unit counts where we have 10, 11, 17 different uh, types of um, sizes here, but you see that the hours per week, in this case at King Street, there was a resident service coordinator going there, but the residents um, did not feel a need for um, that person's time, so they stopped going and Things are going fine there, but um, you know we're always watching that to make sure that we're providing anything that is needed by the residents. But in other cases, we've got one to two hours, we've got four hours per week. Nothing is coming anywhere close to this. The VOC housing is 78 single rooms and they have 15 hours per week. And what we're proposing is um, double that for almost a third of the size of a um, uh, number of units. So we feel that uh, not only the content of the plan, but the number of hours that we're putting on site will really allow the residents to access and, um, and connect with a lot of good support. So the resident service coordinator also works side by side with property management because the communications about how uh, residents are doing in their units, how they're doing paying rent, any other issues that are coming up, property management may be aware of some things and the RSC may be aware of some things. So there's constant communication between the two. Um, and also a lot of times there will be a need for just help to translate, to communicate, um, to coach residents on how to budget or and pay their rent on time, to help with things like housekeeping support. Again, those are things that without a resident um, service coordinator on site, property management would simply give people these violations and kick them out. And the purpose here is to allow people a chance to um, really improve these skills and learn to um, or have the opportunity to live by the house rules and the lease documents. So residents, we hope, and in our experience with this type of support, many remain in good standing. And of course that increases their options. They can stay long-term at this site or they can move on to other opportunities. Um, and then what's important to know is that if residents are not cooperating or responding to issues that are happening with either following the lease or adhering to the site policies, property management does the, then does notify those residents 
and pursue any legal remedies to make sure that um, either the resident is on a corrective action plan that is court ordered or um, takes eviction action if necessary. So all of those rights and responsibilities of landlord and tenant are stated in the lease documents. So in addition to those descriptions above, the residence service coordinator provides orientation for residents, conducts some assessments of what those tenant needs are so they can connect them to the proper folks out in the community, coordinates transportation options, and then plans and facilitates some on-site activities, which can be some workshops, social group activities, that can be a range of things, but those are all determined by what is the right fit for the tenant population. And then social integration activities to foster connections between the larger community, including neighbors and Amherst College. Um, they help to maintain a jobs board so that um, folks can connect to local jobs, offer support for smoking cessation, and then assist or mediate if there are conflicts that come up between tenants that need to be resolved. So the value that's added by this role is that it really creates an encouraging atmosphere for residents. We see that time and again, that um, this is a very commonly um, a role that is added by nonprofit and mission oriented owners and um, managing agents. So an encouraging atmosphere makes a huge difference in how well a property operates. And um, so then the opportunities that come from that for community integration are helpful to um, everyone. That, that's where you have a chance to uh, have a, uh, the diversity and integration of affordable and multifamily housing in a residential neighborhood. So the framework for providers and organizations to work smoothly and collaboratively with residents is something that this role brings and a presence that fosters wellness and independence, um, a respect for privacy and peaceful enjoyment um, to maintain decent, safe and affordable housing. These are expectations for all residents and staff and these are at our properties. This is, this is a um, standing expectation at our properties. The resident services coordinator, uh, this is from the uh, plan that has a much larger job description, but just to keep it simple for the moment, the primary responsibility has been described enough, but it is to coordinate services, initiate referrals, advocate for tenants and assist formerly homeless residents to maintain successful tenancy um, and maximize self-sufficiency. So the requirements are that we do prefer someone with a social work or social services degree. We do often see there are folks that are, have come into this field and through their experience working with low income or at risk populations have got really good success. Um, and so that combination of the either training certification degree or experience are what we look for in a resident service coordinator um, and then some other um, a quarry clearance happens um, and then uh, they need to have a driver's license so that they're uh, able to um, move freely from to and from the site um, for their hours. Um, and there would be cases where there might be, um, you know, some use of a vehicle in their job that would help some residents with um, daily activities. So, but it is not a part of the plan. It was just something that we do require for that position. We also prefer someone who is bilingual. Um, and then another piece of the plan is the budget. I wanna be clear that in this aspect of the budget, what we're laying out is the amount of resources being made available for these residents. So these services in the circle is what's included in the operating budget. So this 45,000 is the resident service coordinator and that is paid for out of operations. The rest of these are estimated times of uh, how much clients would spend working with these outside agencies that we have MOUs with. And so um, the overall cost of services, we're estimating at 166,000 with 45 of that covered by the site. Um, and for after hours access, uh, understanding that uh, there is a concern in our experience at these types of sites, it is just not 
um, it's not a requirement by any program or funding source, but it's also not our experience that it's necessary to have 24 hour staff or services available. Uh, we do expect that residents will have their own support networks if they were to come up with, uh, if they were to have some needs in the, in the night after staff were there. The important distinction here is that if residents were to have needs during the day that require actual service, the resident service coordinator is not a service provider. They would need to go to outside service providers to get that actual help. But after hours, we do want to make sure that residents have access to some other service providers. So we have clinical support options that would provide a 24-hour line. And then for the DMH or ServiceNet referred uh, residents, they have a 24-hour um, access to help with those uh, clients. Property management also has a 24-hour um, call line to respond to any emergencies or maintenance after hours. The community partners that we have reached out to, I think this is one of the reasons why this plan has been um, uh, looked at as robust is that we have really good partnerships and ongoing relationships with uh, community service providers. And we have already entered into preliminary memorandums of understanding with the Department of Mental Health, with ServiceNet, Elliott Community Human Services, the Amherst Community Connections, local veteran service officers in Amherst and the Amherst Health Department. And those MOUs are included in the supportive services plan. We described the proximity to some local services and um, medical supplies first. Um, there are many uh, services that are loca located within walking, biking or convenient access. Uh, board members have pointed out the um, concern about the grade to get to the site. I will say that, again, with this population, uh, all due respect to the concerns, and we will continue to discuss them, but this resident population will be very happy to have a home to walk to and from their grocery store or their services six-tenths of a mile, no matter how steep the hill is. <laughs> um, but uh, this is just pointing out that many of the centers here are close within that half mile to six tenths of a mile range. Um, we could do on-site visits with an Amherst public nurse. Uh, we can, um, residents can get to the pharmacy and then the bus route is nearby. And then there is the Valley Medical Group. And then in Northampton and um, near Northampton, um, additional service net um, CSO and the hospital and the VA Medical Center. The proximity to shopping and meals, we've just listed some of the um, mm -hmm. Craig's doors, I think is familiar to the to many of the board members. Um, Big Y is a grocery store, um, several churches that offer some uh, weekly or um, several days a week uh, food or meals that are available, stop and shop at eight tenths of a mile, and some additional churches that do free community meals in Northampton. Uh, to address this transportation question, I just want to say that what the resident services coordinator does here is help residents to connect with the, what their right fit is for their needs. So we feel, and this is based on experience, that this is a very walkable site, um, that the, the proximity to reach the stores and services just pointed out and others in addition to that, um, six tenths of a mile is a very good walkable site. Uh, from the determination of multifamily housing um, and the scoring that's done to call it, um, you know, to, to, to locate it near those amenities. Uh, on the biking front, we do have the bike covered storage, as we've mentioned. There's a bike trail very nearby at a quarter of a mile and the access point a little bit beyond that. There's a Valley Bike Share Program, two locations within six tenths of a mile and then the bike exchange for bike repairs and purchases at eight tenths of a mile. The higher transportation, uh, the, this, there's more detail about this for both the um, PVTA paratransit vans. This is a service offered by Amherst for seniors and persons of age with disability that provide, prevent them from using typical bus services. So this would be, I think, the thing that to the concern of people needing to get around, I do not believe that people would uh, be in wheelchairs 
going to local services but using this service. Uh, it is available and it is used by people who have those particular special needs. There are other uh, transportation services that um, are coordinated also with the um, service providers that some of these residents might be working with. This is the uh, Route 33 PBTA. The red star shows the uh, location of the site. And then it shows the gray, each of the gray arrows is showing connecting routes from 33. Uh, community integration is very important to us, and we see it happen often um, with studio units, with our family housing, but with independent um, living situations of combined or studio and single room occupancy units. We see a community integration happening, um, and it happens in a way that Oftentimes, you know, one of the comments that gets made is people are surprised. They think residents haven't moved in yet because they think that when the residents show up, there's going to be problems. And it's the exact opposite. Um, here at the lumber yard is an example of that, where people thought there was going to be problems. And instead, there is a very quiet presence, um, very integrated um, presence of this building in this neighborhood. And we see that all the time in well-situated and uh, well-managed affordable housing properties. So the RSC's role would facilitate and promote that we are identifying the right and appropriate ways for residents and neighbors to connect and for residents to also have the privacy that they want, which oftentimes is what they want. Um, a lot of residents simply want to have a home where they go home to and do their own thing. They don't, and, and that's the whole story. But uh, for other residents, they want to be social with each other and in the neighborhood. So the, the RSC would help to connect that with neighbors and um, Amherst College students who have expressed interest in being a part of those community events. A welcome event would also be something that would be planned for people to meet. And um, then there would be opportunities that would be sponsored by local groups that would also be community events, um, just as they're happening in any community. And conversations and friendships happen all the time. This, um, this is just a very common experience that we see at our properties. We did uh, research and development to create our supportive services plan. And in the course of preparing that, um, we went to uh, materials that are commonly used in the industry. This is referring to best practices known um, with a longstanding history of, of providing these um, services over the last 20 years. Um, so we've inter interviewed a number of different agencies that run SROs, and we've got the list of names here. So Alex Jensen, I'm not going to name the list, or mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to read the entire list here. I think you guys can see um, who were... Um, we can read on the slide, but uh, Chris uh, Zabak has given us a lot of help. Um, and we're going to look a little bit at um, some additional slides to just give you some of the credentials of some of these folks that we talked with and the background uh, that we used to come up with this plan. Um, so prior to submitting this draft plan to DHCD, we uh, went to several folks uh, and three of the local professionals that we went to re received and reviewed and commented on the draft. And then we amended the draft based on their feedback. Jay Levy is, uh, lives in Amherst, serves on the board at Craig's Doors, holds a master's in social work from Columbia. He's a licensed social worker and a regional manager at Elliott CSH or CHS. He's published numerous articles as well as four books on the topic of homelessness. And he has years of experience working with homeless tenants placed at Valley properties that are located in Northampton. And he provided a uh, public comment to the zoning board during the July 2nd public hearing saying that he could bear witness to the great work of Valley and HMR. That's the property manager I mentioned earlier. Christopher Zabik is the housing coordinator for the Western Mass Department of Mental Health. 
Uh, he convenes regular roundtables that include Valley, where we exchange what is working well um, and best practices, uh, ideas and resources, including service providers. And that's um, aimed at just a group approach where we're making sure we're sharing and uh, coming up with the best tenancy preservation actions for high risk tenants. And he also has direct experience working with tenants at our properties. John Hornick is an Amherst resident and he's the chair of the Amherst Municipal Affording Housing Trust. He holds a PhD from the University of Illinois, served as the director of planning for the state of New York, uh, the New York State Office of Mental Health and the director of evaluation and client tracking for the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health. He has been involved directly or indirectly in mental, public mental health systems in the planning, research, and evaluation role for almost 30 years. Mr. Hornick directed two studies of supportive housing that were part of a national SAMHSA research initiation at six study sites in total. And the AHP study sites were in Massachusetts, comparing supported housing and group home programs, and in upstate New York, where, they were, where he compared supported housing and supervised apartment programs. Mr. Hornick has been um, involved with Valley uh, on this plan over the past couple of years, and he's provided verbal and public comment to the ZBA during July 2nd, saying that Valley is proposing a social service support well beyond what is normally provided for this type of housing. Lastly, I just wanted to touch on a point, as I mentioned earlier, that um, our tenant selection plan and screening is uh, we would have an outreach program that is based on an affirmative fair housing marketing plan. That is a plan that is very common in affordable housing that would be implemented and approved under state and federal compliance requirements. The selection and screenings would be procedures written that would adhere to fair housing law. That is the case with all of Valley CDC's owned and managed properties. It's a requirement that we um, adhere to those laws at all times. And all applicants would be screened for background and suitability to determine that they are a good fit for independent apartment living according to our selection and screening criteria. Um, between Valley and HMR, each of our staff uh, have extensive experience as respective owners and managers of affordable housing that is regulated by fair housing law. And we do welcome the chance to continue those conversations as the board will bring up related to tenant selection, referrals, fair housing, the homeless set aside or local preference. And then I'll just, uh, I'll leave it there. And um, uh, John Hornick, if he could be introduced, can uh, make a statement. Mr. Hornick. Yes, I'm online. Can you hear me? Yep, we can. Okay, great. Uh, just to, for the record, just identify yourself. Yes, my name is John Hornick. Uh, you may know me currently as the chair of the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, but really my primary identity as someone who did uh, research and evaluation on a range of behavioral health programs for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and also for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So uh, let's see. Uh, I'm just going to say that the research focused on persons identified with a serious mental illness, a substance abuse problem, and homelessness, sometimes all three, with mental, medical issues mixed in as well. In the next few minutes, I will talk about research on permanent supported housing, since that's the most immediate relevant, and it's one way to uh, characterize the Amherst Studio Apartments. Uh, let's see. The Northampton Road Studio Apartments are not the first time that these ideas have been proposed. There is literature on supportive housing that goes back over 30 years and has a major influence on public policy. The first article that I read was published in 1987, and I'll be glad to provide 
references for this and also for other things that I mentioned. Uh, this type of housing, variously identified uh, by federal agency, is generally known as permanent supported housing. In a 2010, SAMHSA uh, identified it as an evidence-based practice, means that there's research supporting this approach, and codified its definition in a manual for housing service providers wishing to implement a supportive housing program. Uh, the elements that must be included include the following. Housing choice. People are offered a reasonable choice of residential options. Functional separation. Services are not provided by the landlord or uh, property owner. Housing and support services are functionally separate. Affordability capped at 30% of income, generally by state or federal policy. Uh, HUD has similar rules. Integration. Fewer than 50% of residents have a psychiatric disability. Rights of tenure. The lease for a unit is in the resident's name. Permanence. There are no actual or expected limits on length of tenure in the program. Service choice. Resident has a choice of what services to accept, including none. Service refusal is not a reason for eviction. Service availability. Appropriate services are available, including ones that promote recovery and support housing stability. Service individualization. Any service plan is individualized, not one size fits all. And finally, privacy. The units are designed to assure the resident's privacy. And I can provide a link to the, all of that. From 1998 to 2003, before these were published, SAMHSA funded a national study of supported housing with six different sites, including that is, six different places, including Massachusetts and upstate New York. I was the principal investigator for both of these sites as well as a member of the overall steering committee for designing and implementing the common elements of the national research. At each site, there was a comparison between a supported housing program and a different program model. Group homes in Massachusetts were the comparison and supervised apartments in New York. People admitted to programs at both sites, regardless of program type, included individuals with histories of homelessness, psychiatric inpatient hospitalization, uh, and living situations that not, did not meet their needs. The major question of the study was, would individuals living in a supported housing program fare better or worse than individuals living in a more restrictive comparison program? There were multiple measures of outcome. The findings were pretty straightforward. There were no significant differences between the supported housing program outcomes and the comparisons. Residents were followed for up to 18 months after program admission. There were no differences in days homeless, no differences in days of inpatient hospitalization, no differences in crisis emergency room use, no difference in days in detox for substance abuse, no difference in arrests, no difference in days working for pay, and no difference in times victimized, and levels of anxiety and depression were also essentially the same. After 12 months and 18 months, residents were generally significantly better off on all of these me measures than they had been at the time of program readmission, regardless of the type of residential program they were admitted to. There were no differences uh, in time over time on a few other outcome measures. This study is not unique. These findings have been replicated in other studies in the US and Canada, both before and after the study I have just described. 
What is the relevance of these housing studies in evaluating the social services coordination plan that has been proposed by Valley Community Development for the Amherst Studio Apartments? First, there is no reason to believe that the social service coordination plan or any other element of the program design will result in poor outcomes for any of the people who will reside at 132 Northampton Road. It follows evidence-based practices. In fact, there is every reason to believe that people who are homeless on admission or clients of the Department of Mental Health or simply other people um, with low income will prosper under this living situation. The implementation of the social services plan through a behavioral health services organization is designed to be functionally separate from the management of the building while taking full advantage of the network of human services available in Hampshire County. Residents cannot be threatened with eviction if they refuse services. Through the resident services coordinator, residents should be offered a range of appropriate services, including health, mental health, substance abuse, employment opportunities, money and asset management, shopping support, social opportunities, etc., all intended to assure both housing stability and social satisfaction. For residents who have behavioral health problems, the service coordination plan meets all of the criteria for a permanent supported housing program. There is no reason to believe that residents would be better off in a more restrictive environment, as I know some people have been concerned. Can anything go wrong? Will every resident remain permanently in their unit or move on to other preferable housing? Of course not. But the program design should assure a successful tenure for most residents and problems for the remaining persons should be appropriately addressed and minimized. For all these reasons, I believe you should be very comfortable with the proposed social services plan and with the general design of these studio apartments. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I will be glad to respond to them. Okay. Um, you've completed your presentation yeah. on them. So what I'd like to do is um, I've, I've asked a lot of questions and have not had it available for the other members to ask. So I want to first allow some of the other members of the board to ask some questions. Um, and then I'll ask some questions as well. So, but first I'd like to provide the opportunity for other board members to ask the question on supportive services plan if they have one. Or if they need a moment to talk, I can start off and give them some time to think about their, <laughs> their questions. So um, the first thing I had was in reading through your supportive services plan is that um, the goals of the plan are really to provide access as opposed to assistance. And I don't think that's, um, I, I don't think that's a meaningless distinction between providing access and providing assistance in obtaining these services. And I want you to talk about that difference. I think you, I see that as just saying, here's what's available, go get it, or if you want, and here, or saying, here are the things I can help you try to find these things. And for, and I'm, I am not as familiar with this, with working directly with this population as you are, or Mr. Hornick is, but I want you to explain to me the difference in that philosophy, because I think that's key. Um, I'm not saying that you require, I'm not proposing a philosophy that everybody is required to have these services, but the difference between just access and assistance is I think key here, at least to my understanding, and I'd like you to speak to that, um, Ms. Lockler. Oh, you're on mute. You've muted yourself. I think it's a really great question and one that is a, uh, 
you know, it, it's different depending on the context and the group of people who are talking about it. Because the conversation that we have within our industry that is about this distinction is very much about the type of plan that we're written, that we've written and, and, and will implement because that access and the access to services and the assistance to getting it is so much about a, a, an ongoing relationship of trust with the resident service coordinator. It's a separation between the landlord, who is the property manager, who a lot of at, at, at any property um, that offers services or doesn't, there can be friction and tension in that relationship. There can be fear that if that anything could lead to you being evicted and losing your housing. The trust that residents build with a resident service coordinator goes far beyond simply here is a list of um, some local services or why don't you, you know, uh, go call this person. It's about building that trust and really understanding the underlying need and then actively making sure that that person does what they need to to get in contact with those other community services and then build that relationship and continue to network uh, through a trusting um, uh, set of like connecting those dots, residents then become a part of community and fellowship and um, groups that are working together on common needs and common issues. And so I would say that that's the main difference there. And one of the reasons why there is such a, a value to this, as John pointed out in his statement, the separation there um, and the, um, the, the, the thing that is missing for a lot of folks who are coming out of isolated situations, whether that is homeless or not, is that they need to know that they're going to be listened to, that they're going to be treated like an individual, that they're going to be given relevant and specific um, suggestions about what might help them. And over time, what we see is that that's what allows that decision for personal growth, that decision for what the goals are that a person is, make, is, is pursuing. And in some cases, we're not emphasizing that residents don't need to access this because they're not going to. We're just emphasizing that it is not a requirement and, uh, and the um, provision, as you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, uh, the, the providing of the direct services. We just point that out because there's freedom of choice for residents to do this. And that's why it becomes effective, is that people over time come forward to, to seek that um, connection. I hope that helps. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the, the thing I hadn't thought about is the um, separation between the property, uh, the landlord role and the um, residential, the, the access role that you provide or assistance role that I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the power dynamic there that, I, that you described that I hadn't thought about um, that it would necessarily exist with a more um, sort of um, um, aggressive approach on the part of the residential services counselor to seek out opportunities to um, assist people to get services as opposed to doing that once they've built a relationship with them and that's maybe right. they feel comfortable with it. Um, so that I think that's a helpful and that, yeah, I mean, a, a very specific example is that people do need help learning how to budget whatever resources they have to work with and whatever they're paying for rent. And you can't go sit with your property manager and tell them you just lost your job and what are you going to do now for three months? Because it's to, to your point, it is a power dynamic and it is a fear that you cannot overshare that. And so then you have somebody to help you. And you also have a different, you have three different populations here in this in it 132 you'll have the formerly homeless people you'll have people you'll have two units with people from the department of mental health and then you'll have people who are um, just frankly working in lower paid occupations and um, you need to be able to treat each of those differently but i suspect that there there has to, how, do, how do you train a residential services counselor to um or how do you what do you expect of a residential services counselor to provide more assistance to those populations that need it um, than those that don't. Because I, I noticed that the, the, the Department of Mental Health has a plan, they have more, much more intervention than the other two populations, tenants do, groups of tenants do. 
but that residential services counselor has got to make that decision between the more aggressive or interventionist approach and just the access approach. How do you, how did they make that decision? What's well, worked in your experience? Yeah, it actually, it, it, it's not, it's typically, um, it might seem counterintuitive to, to think of it this way, but it's actually a little bit the reverse of that, that okay. typically good resident service coordinators quietly and slowly build an invitation so there isn't, it's not about an intervention and it's not about coming at someone like you need this. It's more in welcoming someone to come. And, and that's why these hours, the hours that we're proposing will be effective because for the folks who are ready to look for solutions and help for themselves, those are typically the places where the help happens. And then they hear from other, um, from their neighbors and from other residents, oh, you know, he or she, the RSC, help me out with this. You should go talk to them. And then that, that um, builds. It is not about training, but there is an art, just as there is to any social work, to people who have that empathy and have that ability to build that bridge and welcome people across it. Okay. John might have more to say about that, um, but I'm speaking from a perspective that is very specific about the combination of affordable housing for permanent long-term um, folks who have this access to a resident service coordinator. And that's what I think, that's the other thing that just as we continue this conversation, I think it's a really good one for us to, to continue in future meetings as well, because I think that what's difficult is for people to maybe let go of the fact that a that services control behaviors or that a service coordinator controls behaviors. It's about allowing for a much larger relationship to build between individual residents and that person and then across the whole community. Ms. Pollock? Uh, I, I believe Mr. Hornick has raised his hand if you want to. Okay, Mr. Hornick. Uh, hold on, let me um, mute him. All right. Uh, John, can you hear it? Or can you speak? Yeah. yeah. Um, there is a belief abroad that people with a serious mental illness or other behavioral uh, health problems typically refuse services. That's not the truth. And I will illustrate it with an incident that occurred when I was director of planning for the New York State Office of Mental Health. There's now a law in New York called Kendra's Law, and the law requires that certain people can be committed to involuntary outpatient services. And it was a, a consequence of the fact that Kendra Webdale was standing on a sublate platform and a man pushed her in front of a train. Now it turns out the man who was accused and I think actually uh, either pled guilty or was found guilty by reason of a mental, of mental illness, had a long history in the public mental health system in New York. And in fact, when they looked into the records, they found that he had sought services at two mental health clinics, I believe in the borough of Queens, it's been a while since this happened, and was refused services. He didn't look ill enough to the people who saw him there, but he was actively seeking services. Now, if he'd had a service coordinator, which he didn't have, maybe that person could have provoked, brokered an appropriate relationship with the mental health services and Kendra Webdale's death could have been avoided. I can't say that for sure, but it's not always that a person with a history of serious mental illness is refusing services, and that's what gets them into trouble. And so I think that if the resident service coordinator acts appropriately, builds a level of trust with the people who are in the apartment studios, that when services are suggested, or even perhaps more likely that a person comes and say, I feel like I'm in trouble, I'm feeling suicidal, or I'm feeling this emotion or that emotion, that they will welcome the help of the resident services coordinator. They're not gonna have to be forced involuntarily into treatment. And of course, any 
attempt to do that would be counterproductive and very inappropriate in this setting. And um, thank you, John, because I think that's a, a great um, point. I also, though, want to make sure that the board understands that the selection criteria and the referrals that come will come to this property, it's very important to hear that the right fit and the suitability of these applicants is all about who will live here. So this is not that anyone who wants to live here can live here because they're homeless and they want to. It will be through a referral and through selection criteria that we understand that they would be a good fit. So I think some of the fears that happen around this is that anyone can come and we don't know who they are and uh, we don't know what their issues are. And so I just want to make sure that people couple questions and conversations around this, that we make sure we're talking about that combination of well-suited people ready for independent living who would benefit from and and utilize this person who's a resident service coordinator or not because they might be doing fine without that person or without additional services. Um, I want to open it up to other board members if they have a question, because I, I do think coming back to the selection criteria is important. I'd like to, mm -hmm. if not tonight, uh, some other time come back to that because it's different for each, um, for each population that you're ser serving and it'd be important for the board to understand. Um, do, are there other questions from board members? I know one of the things we were going to talk about is transportation. We um, mentioned that earlier and we, we deferred conver some conversations and questions about that. So I'd like to bring, uh, have that come up now. If I, uh, Mr. Langsdale had some questions about, about transportation, about the role of the the residential service coordinator. And I think there are other um, uh, services and opportunities for transportation assistance for residents of 132 Northampton uh, that might be able to be, that you can discuss. So if you go into more detail about the transportation opportunities uh, available or possibilities available to the, the residents. Well, I think, um, you know, again, in, uh, I'm, I'm going to, I, I would like to say what I can, but also sort of reserve the chance to come back. Again, I am new in my position and yeah. uh, new to a lot of the relationships out here. Well, so then, I want to make sure I would you know, I, Laura's thoughts. You know what? I, I don't want to put you on the spot and okay. I don't want to waste the time of the board if you don't yep. feel that you're ready to answer it fully. And that's understandable. You're, you just okay. got, you're just, yeah. in, you're new in the job. I, I get it. And I've been doing the job before, so I'm not going to push you on that. But I want to make sure that Mr. Langsdale asks the question he wants answered uh, eventually, and then let's do it that way. And then great. we get that like asked, that. Yep. and then uh, you can respond for the next meeting. That sounds Mr. great. Mr. Langsdale, is there anything specific that you would like her to address that we haven't already talked about? Or I think the, uh, the only small thing is, uh, in terms of the transportation, uh, in the presentation, you talked about the uh, service provider uh, helping with uh, transportation options. So I guess part of the question is what exactly are those options that they would be able to help the, uh, the residents with? Okay. So that would be a helpful thing to provide for the next meeting. Yeah. I think that's it for now. Okay. Okay. Do other board, if you have questions, uh, board members, just raise your hand. Um, so I. And uh, if I'm. Go ahead. Oh, yes. I was going to say, I, I, I uh, me and other staff members have been writing notes, um, capturing comments and uh, questions and requests um, throughout this meeting. So we'll. Um, compile those Great. for the applicant, the ZBA members, and to post on the dedicated web page on the town website of what those questions and requests are. I have just a, a clarification question. Um, in the definition of homeless individuals includes, includes several uh, criteria, 
Um, but people who lack the fixed, regular, or adequate nighttime residence, blah, 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 a lot of things where they're living in hotels or camping grounds or they lack um, their emergency or transitional housing or are awaiting foster care placement. Can you please describe how the situation when somebody who's over 18 years of age um, or the appropriate age of majority in, in uh, this situation would be awaiting foster care placement? Is that... If I recall what person. you're, yeah, if I recall what you're citing, I believe it's an overarching definition of homeless that would include minors. There is adolescent housing for, um, ho for homeless adolescents. Um, yeah. And so that would, not, be, not, that would not be applicable here. So right. we wouldn't have, we're not having minors. In we are not one. having minors here. And, okay, I wanted to make sure about that. That's great, helpful. That's a great clarification, yeah. Um, Ms. Parks, thank um, you. I just wanted to go back um, actually to the smoking pavilion. We, the one question that wasn't answered is if seating will be provided or not. And I'm, I'm, I am concerned about that because if seating's not provided, I'm wondering if people will start taking chairs out to that location. So when you're discussing that, can you mention what you would have for seating? Absolutely. I believe we showed a picture of uh, a, a structure example, but um, further design. I, I'm, I, I'm, I've heard Laura talk about the seating. I'm quite sure that's included, going to be included. So we'll and provide a more. Our previous uh, presentations included a illustrative plan, and the and the package shows on the plans a a, a, be, a bench that is being. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. In the last picture, I did I didn't see that, and and, and that, Ms. Stella asked yeah, about it too. And that is a an off the shelf um, image that you, okay. you know from shopping for structure we pull that image and that's the image of what it would okay. be um in your your plan you list um different service needs for different populations in your in the of tenants and for the low and moderate income tenants, the people that are not um, either homeless or formerly homeless or people who are uh, served by the Department of Mental Health, you, your service plan um, focuses on employment training services, access to employment training services, information referral with some support for follow-up, and then skill support, budgeting, supplemental resources, and transportation. So if some of that is the residential services counselor on a, um, a sort of an ad hoc basis, and I don't mean that pejoratively, but right. on an ad hoc basis when it occurs, would provide that. Mm -hmm. But are there other people, um, are there other agencies that you have a relationship with and how you're going to help those individuals who are uh, with those things? Is that, is that done through um, any of your, your, your uh, partners in social services that you've identified? Yeah, I would say that that is the more mainstream band of what we mm -hmm. would make um, our residents available with or without a resident service coordinator. There's just a mainstream band of um, that type of help for around, uh, around employment, around budgeting, around housekeeping. There's just a number of places and um, resources. Those can be evening workshops. They could be a series of um, events um, that you know, I, I don't, uh, again, I can come back with some more examples of uh, the types of programs that we're aware of and use along those lines. It's everything from public schools, from continuing education to services from um, churches and other organizations that you right. provide them with. Is that right. right? Is that what you're saying? Yep. Okay. We are at nine, we're, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think that that's one of the distinctions that, um, you know, when we talk about self-sufficiency, self-sufficiency is something that is typically, typically being aimed for by someone who needs a deeper level of help and is maybe working for a caseworker. They're looking to get to a point of, of really establishing all of the tools and resources they need to have sustained self-sufficiency. For a lot of residents at this site, they will show up with those skills and those resources in place, but that doesn't mean they don't want additional, um, you know, 
boosts of different uh, and, and resources of different sorts. We're at um, 9.13 and we have a couple of things we have to do. And we haven't, I, we haven't asked enough questions or dealt enough with the supportive services program. Um, we took longer on the initial um, finishing up of the July 2nd than I thought we would. So what I'd like to do is suggest strongly to my fellow board members that if you haven't already read the draft supportive services plan and see if you have questions, I think we should continue this discussion in the next meeting. The problem is that with that is that the next meeting we'd hope to deal with um, specifically the, um, uh, the, the need for housing in this area um, the, in, in Amherst, the density of the housing. We wanted to have a robust public comment period as well because we didn't have time for that tonight. Um, and so I think that requires us, Maureen, to try to look at the, skip, the, the, the agenda for the meeting on the 20th um, and maybe change that a bit. But, um, but I think we need to have more time on the supportive services because we've only spent close to maybe a little over 45 minutes dealing with that. And this is a huge portion of it. And I also want to have a short discussion about um, peer review that we may or may not want to have as a board of this or other items uh, of this application. So unless somebody has an urgent question they want to ask of, of Valley right now, I'd like to close down the conversation for tonight, have John Witten describe um, 53G about and what our opportunities are, and then have the public comment period on items other than this application, which we are required to have. And we will be past 9.30 at that point, and we've exceeded our normal time and everybody's patience. So what I, so unless there's an urgent question, I would put, I'd allow, I'd encourage that. If not, then I'd like to ask Mr. Witten to briefly describe the um, ability of the ZBA. And, for, and then before we do that, I wanna thank you, Ms. Lockler, for uh, on, a, on your, early journey into this job, uh, doing a, a, a very good very good job on describing a project that you've come into the middle of. I think I understand and I thank you for that and and uh, and for all the efforts you and your team has put in. Thank you, um, Mr. So we'll come back. Thank you to the we board members for all of your service and time. Thank you. And we also have Maureen, don't let me leave the meeting without going through the, the list, make sure that I that I've got uh, I mentioned all the lists that uh, of items that are were raised earlier that we want to make sure questions that go to Valley. Okay, so um, Mr. Witten, uh, can you, if you're still on the line, can you briefly describe um, 53G, the reason for it, what it allows us to do uh, in terms of getting outside information and how the board, how boards have used that. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, members of the board. <clears throat> so chapter 44, section 53G, allows any regulatory body in Massachusetts to require an applicant for a permit, in this case, a comprehensive permit, to pay for, in advance, to pay for the retaining of outside consultants. The subject matter for those outside consultants can be as the board deems necessary. Typically, a board will seek outside consultants for a, a skill set that the town might not have, or in a small rural town, the town might have no staff. So for example, a traffic engineer or a landscape architect or an architect are typical uh, consultants retained to review comprehensive permit projects. In this case, the board has the right and the authority to require the applicant to pay into a dedicated fund set up by the town treasurer. And that fund would be used for the town to hire a third party consultant. So whether it's a supported services consultant or a traffic consultant or a civil engineer to review the stormwater uh, calculations. The board, they're not mutually exclusive. The board can require an applicant to pay for seven, 10, 12 consultants or just one. The amount to be required is subject to the board's discretion. Generally speaking, especially with a nonprofit, I think the board starts small, you know, with a, a reasonable amount. 
And if the board needs additional money, then the board can require that. Any unspent money by law has to be returned to the applicant. So the town doesn't get a windfall here. The town can't keep any unspent money. Usually, but not always, the board has a kind of a short list of consultants that it wants to hire. And tonight, for example, would say to the applicant, we are thinking of hiring A, B, and C, and X, Y, and Z. And the applicant has a chance to oppose the hiring of ABC or XYZ, but only under two reasons. One is that that consultant has a conflict of interest or that consultant is not qualified. Those are the only grounds to object. And an objection to the selection of a third-party consultant goes to the Board of Selectmen, in, in Amherst's case, to the council. So it, it's not, it, the appeal doesn't rest with the Board of Appeals. And, and I, I think I can predict that this Board of Appeals is not going to choose a consultant that's not qualified or a consultant that has a conflict of interest. So generally speaking, the applicant and the board reach an agreement on the third party consultants. For supportive services, for example, where that short list might not be so readily apparent, uh, the board might actually ask the applicant for some suggestions for a third party consultant. There's nothing wrong with that. And uh, again, I, I would just recommend, Mr. Chairman, that the amount of money the board asks uh, start small. 5,000 is usually a good number, 7,500, 10,000 is typically the, the limit for the first round. If the board isn't sure of who it wants to hire now, then the board could still ask the applicant to pay into the fund subject to they reserve their rights to challenge the selection under those two limited circumstances. So let me stop there, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to go further, but I think, I I think that gives us, that's a, a really good, brief, uh, succinct description of 53G, and I appreciate it very much. Of course. Um, so I, I see this as, there's, in this case, in uh, this application and with, uh, with nonprofits, there are things that are not up to the same uh, specifications as we find with some for-profit operations, whether it's site design or other things. Um, so they're, they're, they're um, not final in design. And that's why it's sometimes um, 53G can be very, very helpful to the board to get an other opinion on, the, on whatever it is that we're concerned about. And so I think 53G is, is a great tool that we can use appropriately, but on only those things that are most important to us and not routinely used as a, uh, um, a, a third party consultant or a peer review on things that we can use either town staff or other people to to evaluate. Um, I was um, I I was thinking very seriously of asking for some peer review on the supportive services plan because it's very important to me. But I I would want to withhold judgment until we've had a chance to review the entire plan as a board before we make that before I make that um, request. And uh, it, and we may learn enough about it that, that we're all satisfied with it without having a peer review. But I wanted to make sure that you understood where I was coming from at this point with my first reading of the, of the peer review without having a full discussion. Um, but uh, so that's where my, my inclination is going forward. But I want to make sure that we have time to discuss this and, and would decide that later. And of course, at this point, I don't have any, I don't, I don't have, and I don't think the board has uh, or the staff has uh, specific recommendations for uh, supportive services peer review. So we'll leave that to a later point in time um, uh, after we discuss the supportive services budget in the next meeting. Um, so the last thing that we have on the agenda is to go through the list of questions um, that were raised for the applicant to get back to or to get back to us on. I just want to make sure that you, we have them all, uh, Maureen, and I've written some down here, um, and you're going, and I want to make sure that you have it there. So we asked about allocating parking in, when it snows, and we're looking at some kind of a uh, an idea of alternatives to to just pushing it onto the pavers. Um, give a comparison of the SRO. Um, Building Valley, okay, I, I know what this was about. Is there a way to give a comparison of uh, how um, 
valley management has the, the ratio of tenants to parking. So just give us a, just go through each of your SRO buildings and just give us the ratio of tenants to parking. Oh, okay. Um, okay. I, 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 so that gives us a, a measure for what you do in other places, right? Yep. Um, you're going to provide something on the medical van where it will park and turn around when the handicapped places are occupied. You're going to have, um, you're going to have a, a room uh, elevation showing the closets. I know we have the, we have the size of the closets, but one of the board members wanted a, 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 a drawing of what it looks like in the room. Um, smoking pavilion sightings, a couple of different options, pros and cons of those. And now we want chairs, make sure there's chairs on there. Um, identifying the, we have to identify the peak roof measurements. I remember that was a discussion about the, I, my, my notes don't make sense here. Just identify what, or what page on, what page on the, uh, on the, the application has the roofs, comparison of roofs with the peak roof, oh. the, the moderate roof. And I think Mr. Uh, the Chalmers, yeah. Mr. Chalmers will be able to show us, provide that for them and we can share that with the members. Uh, we will want to review the management plan and a ref and I will, I think referral and selection criteria is something we didn't get a chance to discuss, but I was, I was going to have more information on that. Um, is there anything else that members of the board want to have just want to have an answer to before we uh, move on for the evening? And Maureen, is there anything significant that I did not raise? I'm sure there's some, there are some things, but is there something, is there anything significant that I did not raise? Uh, I have one, which is um, the RSC um, will help with trans transportation options. And right. what are those options? Detailed options. Right. Yep. Ms. Hardy? Um, I have that Mr. Langsdale wanted to... Your corner of the building to the house at 126 Northampton Road, is that right? But I think I think Ms. Loeffler answered that question with, did, did you have the number? Yeah, it's roughly 175 feet. Um, we have a survey that shows the existing building, but it doesn't have the neighbor's house. And I used all of your GIS to approximate. So it's in that range of 175 feet. Um, we can measure things out if we go back to the site um, with the site visit. Mr. Langsdale, is that satisfactory? Do you want them to go back and measure and take it and get an no, exact that's satisfactory. number? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Hardy. Anything else, Maureen? Uh, and then uh, regarding um, having a uh, elevation of the interior units, uh, I believe that you are proposing um, a few different size units. And therefore, would you like an elevation representing each of the types of unit sizes or just uh, one standard? That's a question for the board, I guess. Well, I think you know, there are three different, there are very different styles. Um, it would make sense. It would, we have two options. You could do one and say, oh, this is represent," and then assert that these are representative of the the different um, models of each apartment, and that and that might solve the problem. But um, if they're not all if they're not all the same, then I think we ought to have you know a drawing for the apart for the clauses for each type of apartment you have. Okay, I think Miss Brestrup has a question or comment. Yes, go ahead. Um, I think okay. that when you were talking about the elevations of the um, interiors, you were really specifically focused on the closet. And is that yes. the case? So you're really yeah. just limiting that to the closet, right? That's right. Thank you. I'm not asked. I, I nobody's asked for an elevation of all the everything in the the apartment. That's a much bigger job. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chris. Yep. Thanks for that clarification. All right. Chris one last, Miss Hardy. Oh, you're you're yeah. muted. Uh, Go ahead. It shouldn't be now. 
Um, Mr. Langsdale asked us um, to supplement um, a description of the RSC's role in helping with transportation options. So that should be on our list of things to do. Yep. Yeah. I think Maureen uh, just mentioned that too, yeah. Okay, sorry. No, that's all right. All right. I think we've got a list. Oh, Ms. Loeffler. Um, and I believe Mr. Langsdale also requested a site walk uh, up Northampton Road prior to the next meeting. We're leaving. He did, and okay. we're not. We're not going to require that. I'm encouraging people to do it, but I'm okay. not going to require that. And if you, if you want to get together and do it, or you can't do it because of open meeting rules. But if you okay. want to, I encourage people to do that. I do it often, and it's it's a hike. All right. I think that's pretty uh, complete list of items. Um, and as I said, we will come out with a, an agenda for the next week, working with the applicant, but also um, with the staff so that we can um, cover fully the items that we want to discuss and not have to break it off in half again and, and disrupt our, our concentration on these really important matters. So, That's, uh, um, that is useful to us so that we've got as much time as possible to prepare and bring back good detail. Yep. It's in everybody's best interest to do that. Yeah. So um, we'll do that sooner rather than later, and we'll let everybody know. The next meeting is on the 20th mm -hmm. of August, and everybody has indicated they can attend. Um, lastly, I, I have no other items on this application to discuss. Um, so I would move that we suspend the public hearing on this matter till 6.30 on August 20th. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? This is a roll call vote. Um, if there's no further discussion, um, I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. So, so this will be on the 20th of August. We will continue with this supportive services plan and we will identify uh, the other topics as in addition to public comment that we will have in the on the 20th. In um, each of our meetings, we, are, we provide the opportunity for the public to comment on any matter that is not the subject of this public hearing. So if there's anybody out there um, who's attending this meeting virtually and they wish to speak on a matter, not including the matter before the board tonight, we would um, welcome their comments. Please raise your hand um, and, and then if, if recognized, identify yourself and give and limit your comments to three minutes. I don't see any hands raised. Do you, Maureen? Okay. Um, if there's no public discussion, I move that we adjourn this meeting of the ZBA and to, and to meet again on August 20th at 6.30. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Mr. Maxfield, um, is, any discussion? It's a roll call vote is required. I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Motion is unanimous. Motion carries. Um, I want to thank everybody for their work tonight, and we will see you all um, in two weeks. And you'll, we'll get out to you before that uh, agenda for, the, for that meeting and a list of uh, questions we have for the applicants. Thank you very much.